Rival House Network. Howdy, gang. Zach and Aaron are back with another episode of Cinema Enema. Uh, please excuse the lapse. Uh, this is We're doing these monthly. This time, we kind of waited a couple of months because we took a lot of time out to do uh, robo-sploitation or cyborg-sploitation for the BTM podcast. So uh, forgive us, but the cleanse was needed because we're kind of going to play with new format stuff. Uh, if you guys have been following the program uh, since its inception, then or conception, sorry, it's... It's been focused on a single movie, right? Typically, uh, ideally something I haven't seen or Zach hasn't seen. Uh, and we when we just talk about it after we've watched it. Zach had a great idea. Uh, that's all I got. That's all he's got. That, you know, we should broaden the topic, and which kind of leads to what we're going to do for uh, the main portion of this show. But it doesn't necessarily have to be about a single movie. We can talk about uh, franchises. We can talk about debates within franchises uh, to, to be uh, to open up the discussion even more. So I think it's really cool and it's going to be exciting. And I'm excited to do this episode, too. But as tradition dictates, we're going to start off by talking about the news and then we'll get into what we've been watching lately. Just kind of shoot the shit uh, and break the ice a little bit before we get into the the meat of the hour. So the cock and balls of the course. Yeah. So it's it's been a couple of months, man. So ideally. I mean, if we're really going to be centered around fucking news, we'd, we'd have to be on this shit, but we don't care. We probably missed a lot of stuff, but the only things that I wanted to talk about, the big things obviously is Bill and Ted. Zach wants to talk about Bill and Ted. The Bill and Ted face the music trailer dropped. Uh, it's been a few weeks or a couple weeks since still the- don't like the title. We need a more consistent title scheme. We need Bill and Ted's triumphant expedition. Or something like that, or triumphant return, or something. Yeah, yeah. it doesn't it, it doesn't quite fit because everything's excellence, uh, bogus, and it's got a Bill and Ted uh, ism in there somewhere. Mm. But I, I've warmed up to it. I don't really care about it so much. Yeah, yeah, it really doesn't bother me that much. But what um, one thing that does kind of bother me, I have to get over is I know they're putting out some promo materials where they're kind of grouping all the movies together, you know, completing the trifecta and they keep throwing all the logos next to each other. And when you, the first two logos match, right? They're in sequence, you mm-hmm. know, the themed and the new one's so modern. Like, uh, yeah, it, the, the, the original title for two was Bill and Ted go to hell also. So uh, it does kind of fit the original title for part two, but it's like, yeah, it just kind of sticks out like a sore thumb now. But whatever. Well, yeah, yeah, but it's just the way the font looks. The font looks modern because you know the the first two movies have like that radical, like mm-hmm. hand drawn looking font. And, but whatever, this is all just nitpicky shit. It's not a big deal. Part two, one of my favorite movies of all time. I got the original poster. I want to get it signed someday. I hope. Yeah, to. it it doesn't go for much, does it, Shirley? Or how nope. much did you get it for? Yeah, it's, I don't remember. That's the benefit of liking sequels actually better than the originals because then you look out because there you get the posters on the cheap. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's like fucking. I like all the Rocky movies. I like all the Rambo movies. I can't afford a First Blood poster. Well, I don't want to. You can get that Rocky Five poster. No, I'm so, no. I mean, so let me rephrase it. I don't. I can't justify putting down the money for a Rocky One poster or a First Blood poster. But you know what? I ha- I have every other Rocky poster. Rocky Two, Rocky Three, Rocky Four, Rocky Five. I do have Rocky Five. Uh, and Rocky Five is the superior film. James Gunn or Tommy Gunn? I mean, Tommy Gunn, James Gunn. Uh, hey, James Gunn made age jokes, which killed Tommy Gunn. Crazy. Full circle. Anyway, or did he just make? Ilya jokes. I don't remember. Fuck. He, we he just did, got demonetized. He did have. Yeah. We we're supposed to say Play-Doh. Play-Doh. Maybe beep that out. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, because I figured it out. That's what it is. We have all these episodes of all of our shows and I everything is so vanilla. Like we don't do anything wrong. And I'm like, man, somewhere in this episode, a word comes up 
And it doesn't matter what the context is. You know, you could have a serious podcast topic and you could have been talking about Jeffrey Epstein on an episode of Deep End or something like that. And obviously there's certain words that people are associating with Jeffrey Epstein lately that would just instantly flag uh, the episode. Right. So it kind of sucks. He's the king of Play-Doh. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, but anyway, back to Bill and Ted. So I, I think. Zach is trying to avoid all trailers and stuff. He wants to go in totally just d- new with I, it. I did go. see the first trailer, but yeah, okay. I did, and they showed very little. And I was just like, I'm just going to go ahead and not watch anymore. Now watch like they did like a uh, Comic-Con. Like they, they didn't have Comic-Con because they had to, you know, the quarantine. So they did it over the Internet. And like I stayed away from that, but I did see one little freaking well, spoiler. We're like, getting ahead of ourselves. We're getting ahead of ourselves because let's talk about the second trailer because that came out first. Right. Mm -hmm. So which I guess you avoided. I -hmm. was the same way. I watched the first trailer and Mac and I and Zach were talking in in a a group chat or whatever about it. And I think Mac was kind of not feeling it. And he's like, they're just so old. I and he said the trailer was disappointing. I liked the first trailer because I think it did exactly what trailers need to do and they don't do anymore. They didn't give us anything. They gave us everything we needed. And that was. Hey, here's Bill and Ted in a new movie because we already know they're already they're just catering to the already established fan base. So they showed Bill and Ted. They had a brief thing with them meeting death at the very end. That's really all you need. It's like they didn't give away anything story wise. And they had one like gag in there, right? The prison thing, which was cool. Mm -hmm. Uh, It was it was plenty. And I was like, Zach, I'm like, I don't want to watch anymore. But then I got weak, man. They released a trailer, two, and I watched it and it was more of an extended trailer. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I have to be totally honest. It. I, I wish I didn't see it because, yeah, it, this one gave away a lot. <laughs> like, fuck. Mm-hmm. Uh, and oh, I hope I'm wrong, but the trailer made it really seem like uh, sequelitis. Like a lot of movies do, especially when they're making a sequel 30 fucking years later. Like, what can we really bring new to the table? We got to cash in on, on people's nostalgia because it's been so long. Um, mm-hmm. And it seemed like they were hitting a lot of the same beats. Right. From the, from both movies from well, at least they're not ignoring the second movie. I know a lot of franchises, they just want to like do that with the first movie and ignore the sequels or whatever, because they're not as beloved. But uh, mm. no, it seemed like they were hitting the beats of the first two movies. And I'm like, OK, well, I'm going to give it the benefit of the doubt. We're dealing with time travel. Maybe that's just the way I'm looking at it. Uh, and I guess and also I notice a lot, and this is to be expected with a modern movie, but it looks like a lot of the movie was filmed. Behind a green screen. Yeah, that's going to be a fucking definite, which is which sucks, but whatever, I guess. Yeah, like, yeah, like there's like a lot more scenes of them in hell and stuff, and it doesn't look nearly as cool as the shitty looking warehouse set they were in in the second movie, mm-hmm. right? Where they're just using lights and smoke machines or whatever the fuck. Uh, yeah, this is... Are they going to call the, the devil a fag again, though? <laughs> I doubt it. We just got demonetized again. <laughs> no, but they won't. They won't. I can say uh, that because I'm a fat faggot. Well, what I hope, though, is to, and also, since we're now in, uh, fuck, 2020, are they going to stay true to their characters? But even though we're not in that era of of listening to Skid Row and Megadeth anymore, you know, but that's still who Bill and Ted were, right? Because okay. I noticed, I, I know, okay, so take, for example, in the first movie, Jim, Jim Martin had a cameo, right? Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. Makes sense. In the early 90s, Faith No More was a thing. Rock was popular. It was all over MTV, Headbangers Ball. It was culturally relevant. Now I noticed on IMDb that like Kid Cudi or Wiz Khalifa, they're like fucking in the, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Somewhere in the fuck. See, it's probably going to be one of those things where like that's what the, the daughters are into and it's going to be like the generational clash. I hope so. I hope so. But I I don't think, it, it kind of sucks because... I don't think they're going to make too many of those sweet Bill and Ted references, right? To pop culture, because they, they can't make a Megadeth reference in this movie, right? Because what, no kids, no fucking, I, unless they're really catering to you and me, right? And it feel it kind of feels like they are. The marketing for it has been questionable it, in the sense that I, I, don't, I don't see super heavy marketing, uh, which tells me they're just maybe trying to go after the demo that really cares about it because it'd be kind of hard to make a sequel that's so much later uh, to really expect to get a bunch of new fans. Uh, going to try to swipe up all them John Wick fans. Well, I, I, I'm saying I would be really happy if there was like some kind of like knockback to the whole, 
can I have your Megadeth collection? It's yours, dude. Mm-hmm. Right? Just stuff like that. But that stuff's not as culturally relevant. If Jim Martin showed up in this movie, no one's going to fucking know who Jim Martin is. Like, well, who the fuck is this guy? Um, but anyway, some of that has to be expected. It moves along with the times. But uh, I didn't mind that they were old. I kind of thought it was weird. <laughs> I kind of think it's weird they shaved his face. I get it. It it, it keeps it in line with the first two movies where, where Ted didn't have a, any facial hair, but... He just looks fucking weird with that facial hair now. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, but anyway, I watched that second trailer. Like I said, it looks like it's doing a lot of that. Okay, it retreads. Uh, even down to like an extended glimpse at death. And I'm like, okay, well, I'll just give it the benefit. And um, yeah, and, and you were talking about the Comic-Con at home thing. Everybody knows that they're doing every. As we're recording this right now, they got Lollapalooza live streaming. Right. Mm. And it's like, I, I guess it's still live and there's an actual schedule, but everybody's just sort of live streaming from their backyards. Like Josh Homme was doing like a, a set in his backyard with an acoustic guitar. Right. Metallic is on right now and I'm missing it for this. Uh, and I don't know what that's going to be. Are they like all going to be on a Zoom meeting? Oh, how the fuck? That's going to rid you of some beta DNA missing that. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm just going to watch the recap. I'm just going to watch it after. But uh, anyway, so. They did Comic-Con at home. They had an official panel and everything. And it was like a Brady Bunch Zoom meeting where they had all everybody and their mom in there. They had William Sadler. They had uh, Alex Winter and, you know, Keanu and fucking the daughters. And, you know, and and it was hosted by or Kevin Smith. Now, I I decided, okay, I'll watch this. This should be fun. But because I don't want any spoilers. These motherfuckers be spoiling shit, man. Mm -hmm. Now, go ahead and tell them. Like, do you want to or do you want to you don't want to be the same guy and spoil it for anybody else? Uh, yeah, maybe we shouldn't. Maybe okay. You know, it'll come out soon and we'll watch it and we'll talk about it. Let's just say Kevin Smith dropped one. And he even acknowledged like, yeah, this might be a spoiler. They might want to cut this out. But then it's like, okay, so they recorded this, you know, they pre-recorded it. Why didn't they cut it out? Just yeah. Just put a beep there or something. And it, it's nothing that was story breaking. It's just one of those things that was meant to obviously put a smile on old fans face when they saw it for, for themselves. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, it's kind of like, um, uh, it's kind of like, uh, when evil dead, that remake came out and everybody already knew that Bruce Campbell had a cameo, right? Like mm-hmm. what the, f- like, okay. And you're just waiting for it. And then you're just disappointed because it's nothing, but yeah. it's one of those things. And anyway, it didn't stop there. I was disappointed. I kept watching. I'm like, oh, how did Kevin Smith fuck this up? Anyway, the chicks that play his daughters kept talking about stuff. They kept bringing up. So every time somebody said something. I could see Alice Winter's face in the corner, which he had a constant smile on his face because he's excited. This is his baby. Every time somebody said something like this, he just kind of like widened his eyes a little bit. Never left a smile, but you could tell like, oh, man, come on. <laughs> he's like, yeah. stop. Because he's see, been working a- on us for so long, man. It's like, I think he cares about fans seeing this little surprise here, that little surprise there. That's the thing. Like, they think they have to let us know as much as we possibly can. You know, without spoiling it, but it's like, you know, it, it, we've gotten so used to that, like where trailers are telling you plot by plot, you know, the detail and everything. It's uh, uh, yeah. And uh, oh, man, I'll tell you, the, you know, what was worse than what Kevin Smith said. One of the the girls, I don't remember who it was, which daughter it was, the actress. She straight up described the opening scene of the movie. Oh, yeah. Did you see that? No, dude. Fuck me. She and I, I literally put my hands on la 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 before I could get to the remote because she started talking about the as soon as it comes in and it was pretty, pretty movie setting like like this is setting the tone. And I'm like, why are you fucking doing this? Mm-hmm. It's kind of like uh, how I knew the first scene of Dark Fate was John Connor getting mm-hmm. killed <laughs> and she was going into detail. Uh, no, and, and, and it was innocent enough, right? Cause they're asking her about like, oh yeah, you know, your, your relationship with your on-screen dad. And she'd be like, it's like, oh yeah, you know, on screen. we'll take for instance, the very first scene of the movie, it opens up like this and we're doing this and we're like, what the fuck are you doing? You stupid cunt. And I could see Alex Winter's face just kind of like, <laughs> what are you doing? Um, uh, but yeah, but, and, and at the same time though, everybody else, except for Bill and Ted on that screen and, and Kevin Smith. They were admitting like the girl, the daughters, they never seen Bill and Ted. Mm -hmm. They never seen any of them. And they, and, (laughs) and they got the roles having never seen them. So they're, and they're too young anyway, probably. So it's like, they, they probably don't realize they come from a generation where they don't give a shit about spoilers, I guess. I don't fucking know. Or they don't quite realize. See, I usually don't give a fuck about spoilers either until it's like something like. But they probably don't quite realize um, the uh, investment 
old fans have in the series, right? That mm-hmm. were there in the last movie because they they they're just not connected to it. So whatever. But I I turned that shit off after I got like three of those fucking spoilers, and I whatever it comes out, it's right around the corner. I mean, as of this recording, I think it comes out in like what just a few weeks. I think uh, is it August, the beginning of August or September. Well, no, it's August, I believe. So it's July thirty first. I think it comes out in just a couple of weeks. And it's coming to video on demand and theaters, apparently. Which makes sense. I mean, it it was either that or they push it off to next year. So I, I just I'll take it, you know, and uh, I'll support it. And it, the good thing about it being on VOD is Zach and I could do a commentary that fucking night. Like, I, and I told Mac, I'm like, I think we should all rent it, watch it, and then do a fucking commentary right away, uh, or or you know, a cinema anima or something, right? We we got to capitalize on it, be fun, mm-hmm. because it's something everybody can actually take a part in, and we're not getting something illegal that nobody else can get or whatever. Um, and then I think Zach said, "What did what did Mac? Or sorry, Mac, what did Mac say?" He's like, "Well, it's like, well, <laughs> go and tell." It's like, uh, man, Zach can just freaking rip it, and I'm like, I ain't ripping it. I'm gonna support this movie. <laughs> yeah, and that's what's wrong, man. That's what's. <laughs> I mean, I don't want Alex Winters to kill himself and have to do documentaries the rest of his life about I child. Mac will, Mac will come back on the next time and be like, why don't they make movies like this anymore? Yeah. And I'll be like, because of you, you fucking idiot. And his, <laughs> and his, and his hacked fire sticks, his jailbreak fire stick. That's what he's always saying. He's like, dude, get a fire stick. He's like, dude, it's on the fire. Whenever I'm talking about watching something or he'll be like, have you seen this? And I'll be like, no. He's like, dude, it's on fire stick. I'm like, ah, no, it's not. But what he means is, oh, it's his jailbroken fire stick. Oh, it's on your jailbroken fire stick. So literally anything's on fire stick. But like he always uses it as a broad term. Like, dude, it's on fire stick. <laughs> like, like as if it's like on a nap. So I'm like, no. Um, but yeah. So that is what it is. But I'm still stoked for it. And we'll have to, we'll have to plan something to do something. Uh, that might be a fun live commentary hangout. Mm-hmm. I, I, you know, I, I, cause I would like to do something like that here real soon. Uh, but moving on from Bill and Ted, though, I, we should set our expectations realistically. Zach has the right idea. Like, go into it. Just I'm expecting we're going to walk in. It's going to be all Hollywood. They're going to do all the shit I didn't want them to do. I'm just assuming that so that if maybe it'll be it'll entertain me, it'll be surprising, hopefully. Yeah. Well, anyway, I'm going to be the same. I don't want to be disappointed. I just want to be happy that we have any kind of Bill and Ted after all these fucking decades. And And I swear they were talking about. One, Alex Winter was talking about wanting to get Bill and Ted off the ground. I remember in fucking ninth grade, <laughs> like Bill he, and Ted three, yeah. So yeah, this yeah. the script's been that's the same writers. You gotta wonder like how much of it did they have to change because of the studio now? Like oh, people don't know who that is. You gotta put a newer guy in there. Who knows? And and they got the director from uh, what's it called uh, the fucking Tim Allen movie Galaxy Quest, which is a lot of fun, which a lot of people really like. Dog. All right, moving on uh, really quick. Halloween Kills, they announced that it's going to be centering on Laurie Strode's granddaughter, and she's going to be more of a support, Laurie Strode. Uh, Figured. Yeah. I mean, I I guess that's kind of predictable, I guess. I mean, with the way the last movie ended with her and the knife, right? Mm -hmm. It's literally like a passing of the torch, but it's a passing of the the blade. Uh, It is what it is. So are they going to kind of do the predictable and kill Jamie Lee Curtis in the next one, then, if it's like a passing of the torch, or is she confirmed to be in the th- all three? I would hope so. That'd be dumb to kill her again. I mean, they've killed her a million times. I'm sure she likes the money now. Now it's like, now, like, when it's like once they realize they're older, and it's like, you know, and maybe it's not that bad that I, I, I was doing horror movies. Like, for some reason, they, it's like a, a black mark on their record, at, like, in their young. Younger days. Well, when they're trying to break it into like mainstream serious Oscar, but anybody that ever dreamed to be an actress or whatever, they probably dream of winning that Oscar and, and giving that acceptance speech. And they probably know that that's never going to be a horror movie. And they probably know that being in a horror movie, getting your start in horror is like wearing a scarlet letter when you're trying to get those serious roles. But yeah, man, it's. I think it's different today. Like now, uh, horror is such a big business with like Comic Cons and shit like that and fandom. You know, something like the Halloween franchise is going to make Jamie Lee Curtis a lot more money if she wants to do a signing or whatever than a fish called Wanda. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? So I I just wish people would just fucking eat their words and just own up to it because I don't think she's ever said anything. She's never stated like, yeah, I, I looked at it the wrong way. You know, now I have an appreciation. She just sort of flipped her script <laughs> overnight. Mm-hmm. And uh, I guess it was with that whole the night she came home documentary when they put out that uh, anniversary edition of Halloween, right? That was her first like convention. Did you see that? 
Mm-hmm. And I don't, I don't remember what her attitude was like during that whole thing. But uh, I remember when that was going on. Uh, there were, like I was hoping to go to it. Yeah, but it was, it was a big deal. It's a huge turnout. Uh, anyway, I, we'll see. I don't know. I'm gonna go into that movie with a certain expectation because the first one's just meh. Um, but whatever. Maybe it'll be better. Who knows? Maybe it'll be better because now they don't have to live up to it being yet another reboot and a direct sequel to that, you know, first couple of movies. Mm-hmm. Maybe they'll be like, okay, now we feel like we can be a little bit more free or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, all I know is I don't get excited when they talk about, you know, you have the writer hyping it up saying, oh, this movie is brutal. It's brutal. brutal. It's the most brutal, the brutal kills and brutal. the body counts insane. And I'm like, that's never really what I think the Halloween franchise was it necessarily. You know, it's like, that's what Jason was. Mm-hmm. Uh, but anyway, last little bit of news I have is Courtney Cox officially confirmed for Scream 5. Last time we chatted on this show, it was just uh, Dewey, David Arquette. Um, so surely all these offers are extended to all the main cast. It's just a matter of them coming to an agreement and, uh, you know, inking, inking that contract. So, but yeah, so we have Dewey. We, we got an how do you think they you know are going to be together <laughs> a, a, an ex married couple acting next to each other i think uh, four was done after their divorce wasn't it were they were the divorce they might have been i don't know maybe unless they have to write in a script like that like hey okay in the script here's you you have to make us also divorced like i don't want any closey scenes i don't want us to rekindle anything you know you don't want to probably have a certain dynamic with your ex on screen mm. but but I mean, you're a true actor. It's like you have a, you have to have a sex scene. You have to have an anal sex scene with your ex wife who took half your money. She's gonna fuck you, and she's gonna fuck you, man. I've been watching Shameless, man, and they got uh, <laughs> they got a uh, fucking Joan Cusack, fucking uh, William H Macy with a giant dildo strap on, strapping him to the bed, handcuffing him, and then fucking raping his ass with a fucking gorilla sized dick. That's hot. Yeah, it's fucking weird. Did you have any other news bits you want to talk about? Or do you want to kind of talk about what we've been watching? Uh, we could talk about uh, the new Friday 13th box set. They're going uh, yeah. to. Yeah. Uh, they're they're going to have fucking. It's like 120 something bucks, 150 bucks, something like that. And uh, they're going to have. Uh, what is it? Uh, they're going to have the real 3D version of part three, which like. That's kind of like I would get that, but I don't have a 3D TV. So hopefully like uh, they do what they did with the other ones and they put out like a, you know, because they put out the single disc version of like the the peak cut of Halloween six. Hopefully they do that with uh, Friday 13th tree. Mm. And then it's going to have like the uncut version of Jason goes to hell that everybody asked for everybody. Everybody wants it. Oh yeah. D- did you score yourself a, a pre-order or no? I think it's just too much for what they, for their, I just, it's cool. It's really cool, but it's like I have a hard time justifying it. I didn't. I yeah. already got the the last Blu-ray set they put out. Yeah, I feel like if you're going to pay that price tag, you're really just paying for the sweet package because it is a cool package. I was kind of eating my words a little bit when I saw it because I was shit talking it, but I'm like, the package is cool. And I guess some new special features, but I'm just, you could get the one Zach is talking about for so much cheaper, right? I think it's out of print. I think you can't get that one anymore. Is it out of print? I don't yeah. know. I don't know if I, if I win like a fucking ten thousand dollars scratcher ticket, I might get one. <laughs> but I just it's just hard. Sometimes I have those. But then they didn't even tell us what all the special features and like the the rest of them will be announced soon. But like you know, uh, hopefully if we announce something you do want to see, you didn't already skip out because it's a limited release and we might be out of copies before we give the whole list of uh, special features. Is it already sold out? Because I don't think it had that many comp. How many did they limit it to? It started out like 5,000 and they upped it to like 9,000 or something. Well, and I'm wondering, surely when this runs out, they're not just going to let that be the end of their license they paid for. I would think they're either going to keep reprinting them on demand or they're going to release a bare bones collection without the sweet set. You know what I mean? Or release them individually. And let's fucking like Paramount just completely stupid because Paramount doesn't give a fuck about those and they never like like really care to like put out other copies. So I don't know why they would be like, ah, well you only get it for a little bit. And it's got Freddie versus Jason in it again, right? Oh yeah. It depends on how you look at it, the value. I mean, if you're looking at it as like, well, you know, I already own these movies a million times over, or I can get a cheaper box set elsewhere um, for it's not worth. But if you're looking at it in the way of scream factory and how they price their titles, if you're just a diehard shout person, you know, if if they did sell these movies individually, you know they would charge 
20 to 30 bucks, depending on, you know, how long you want to wait for a sale. So yeah, they need to stop that. Like they just put the price down more people buy more of their stuff. Uh, so if you're looking at it like that and you're one of these people that buys just shout stuff all the fucking time, technically all those movies would cost you like three, 350 bucks. So if you want to, if you want to kind of view it like that, I guess you're getting a deal. I don't know, but mm-hmm. well, yeah, I mean, and I wish more and more retailers would carry them because I think uh, different people have reported that various Walmarts have started carrying a lot more shout factory. And when Walmart carries it, you know, you're going to get shit for like 10 bucks. Best Buy, every Best Buy started carrying more Shout Factory titles. Um, like you can get Mad Max, you can get uh, Army of Darkness, you can get, I've seen tons of titles there. The ones I already have, unfortunately, but like they'll be 10 bucks when they when they go to a big box. Um, and outside of that, Am- Amazon always has way better deals. I, I don't, I know they try and incentivize by saying, hey, order through us, pre-order it, and you'll get like the laminates and the little posters and right i Mm -hmm. i don't give a shit about that shit i saw the vestron collection brand is like lowering their price to like 13 bucks that's good that's good they got that little monsters blu-ray coming now with that uh with that incentive to pre-order right through them i don't think like oh you're getting a free lithograph you're not getting a free lithograph you're paying about 15 bucks more buying through them like you could buy it for 20 bucks pre-order on Amazon and then whatever. I mean, it depends. It's like that lithograph worth 10, 15 bucks to you. Maybe I don't fucking know. I have a few of them um, because you know, what's funny is a lot of those movies, they don't ever sell out of them. So like I'll, I'll get shout factory titles like during their whole October big sales events that they have. And then I might get some stuff during those times. I mean, the last couple of years I did. And I bought a whole bunch of collector's editions that had been out for a few years and I still got all the packaging and I got like fucking posters. I'm like, oh, okay. So there's really no incentive here to really pay their crazy prices. But yeah. And then they have the worst customer service. Let's be honest. It's fucking terrible. It's absolutely terrible. And they can't, um, they can't contain, they, they don't know how to work with their volumes. Like, I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's like, Hey, we don't, we're, we're a small business. We, we don't want to cut into our profits. So we don't want to hire more people, but they, they fail to acknowledge how much more business and how big they've gotten in the last few years, you mm-hmm. know? Uh, Cause there's always like a, there's always lack of demand, especially in those October sales, man. They know it's coming. They do it every year. But whenever you place those orders in October, those sales, dude, I swear it takes fucking five months to get your order. And then no one will at, tell you about, no one will talk to you. Like when you try and reach out and um, the only time they'll talk to you is if you start slandering the fuck out of them on their Facebook page, then somebody <laughs> might, might say something cause you're hurting their name. But uh, I, all I know is I've called, I've talked to a customer service there in the last few years when I've made orders and it's always the same fucking person. It's like, I, I feel like one person's answering phones and answering emails. Mm-hmm. So uh, other than that though, it's fine. I like their product. Uh, what uh, what have you been watching, man? You want to start that off? Oh, yeah. Let's go back and forth. Uh, I, I watched that Contagion that's on HBO. It's funny how, like, uh, life experience will change how you watch a movie. Because if I saw this movie in, like, 2011, I'd be like, this movie's fucking boring. Nothing happens in this movie. There's nothing interesting about this. But now it's like, hey, this is kind of like what's going on now. And it's like, oh, this is interesting because it's like, oh, they try to guess how, you know, American citizens would react to this stuff happening. And yeah, some of it they, they nailed, some of it they, they got kind of wrong. And yeah, yeah, it was uh, it was worth a watch. I know when the pandemic and the lockdown first began like four or five months ago, wherever it was, it feels like I, I've lost time. But I remember the that movie was trending. Mm-hmm. On Netflix, it, it went on Netflix and went and it was like the number one movie for a while because I don't know. I think at the very beginning of all this, people were very into it. Now you couldn't fucking pay me to watch a pandemic anything because I'm just fucking over it. <laughs> I'm over it, man. And all I know is once reality kind of comes back and and, and norm, normalcy kind of sets back in, I swear to you, if if people are dumb enough to come out with a whole shit ton of pandemic movies, right? Like if that's how unoriginal Hollywood is. To where during the pandemic and the lockdown, they use it. They probably they, won't touch this subject for at least like three years or something. I, I hope they don't. And then they'll make a biopic. Mm-hmm. Like a like a tongue in cheek, you know, not exactly to the tr- to the facts, but I I just, I hope they don't. But I, I have to imagine if you're a writer, especially a professional writer, you're using this downtime to create, load up on your law, you know, build your portfolio. But I, if there's anybody that's actually writing a pandemic movie and, and they think it's a good idea, just stop. 
I feel bad for the guy that was writing it before it happened. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you know, I feel bad for the guys that are writing a brilliant idea and then somebody else beats them to it just by, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, cause there's only so many ideas out there and then you might be this guy that's like, you know what? Nobody's really done this kind of mixture before. Nobody's kind of done this kind of angle of this kind of genre before. I got a pretty cool idea or I can't believe somebody hasn't tried this. And then like, <laughs> Yeah, there could be somebody somewhere else that's got a lot of money and it's just all of a sudden you've been pouring five years into a project. You could be an indie, like a project that I want to do. We could work on this thing for five years. We could get funding on an indie level. We could have everything planned. And then Hollywood fast tracks a story that's very similar. Like what the fuck? It, you would just be crushed. Like, well, fuck mm-hmm. me. Everybody's going to think you're the ripoff artist because your movie's indie. It's going to take a lot longer to come out. It's going to look like you're following them. Mm-hmm. But it is what it is. It's all like uh, timing. Uh, so you want to go back and forth? You want me to go next and then you and then in that way? If you want to. Uh, yeah, we could do that. Um, I, If you guys listen to the, the BTM show, I think I've mentioned it. But I got HBO Max and, and they have rights to the Studio Ghibli studio, you know, properties. And so I've been uh, chipping away at those because I've, I've never been an anime guy. I've just never been into it. Studio Ghibli, though, I've always understood was kind of like the Walt Disney of Japan in anime. Like it's huge. Mm-hmm. Like they're, they're huge blockbuster deals over there. They're massive. I think Spirited Away is the highest grossing or the second highest grossing movie in Japan of all time. And, and that one won like Oscars and shit. So it's not like normal anime, but, um, and, and they're really cool. I've been watching all the big ones first because they got quite a bit. I've been watching all the Miyazaki ones, if, if I said his name right. So The guy that made uh, I Spit on Your Grave? No. <laughs> wow. I watched. That'd be, that'd be fucking funny. No, I watched um, My Neighbor Totoro. I watched uh, The Cat Returns, which wasn't a Miyazaki one. That one was just all right. But the Miyazaki ones, My Neighbor Totoro was really, really good. Uh, Kiki's Delivery Service is really, really good. Uh, fucking what else did I watch? Uh, Spirit Away was probably my favorite one. Uh, and then I watched like Princess Mononoke. And the thing about these movies is when you watch an anime, like a traditional anime, like a hey, 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 like crazy fucking cowboy bebop or whatever, mm-hmm. it feels like an anime. Like this is the this is the medium where it belongs. These uh, Studio Ghibli movies, they could easily be live action features. Mm-hmm. That like like Princess Mononoke, you could, it could easily be a live action fe- feature. Um, they all could, which is really cool. Spirited Away is fucking an acid trip. Like just some of the wacky ass characters that are in, and some of the it's like a fever dream. Um, and it's hard not to appreciate it. And I, I I've been enjoying the hell out of them. Uh, so and they're all consistently good. Like they're all fucking really good. And I and I'm one of those guys where I I always had friends that would always be all over those movies. And when they would get like Western releases or something, they'd be like, Oh yeah. We will watch. And I'm like, I don't want to watch that shit. Mm-hmm. And I, I kind of like of eating my words because they're really good movies and I'm not looking at them as, as animated movies or anything like that, because then I tend to, you know, pigeonhole it somewhere, but no, as a movie, they're just really, really good. They got epic scores, really good music, um, really good adult themes. Some of them are kind of whimsical themes, but they still have some underlying adult stuff in there. It's, it's I, I recommend them. If you ever get HBO Max, Zach, try watching one. And uh, mm-hmm. they're, they're, I think they're for people that don't like traditional anime. Okay, mm-hmm. so you can go. Uh, also on HBO, I watched uh, Before the Devil Knows You're Dead. The movie with Philip Seymour Hoffman. Oh, yeah, yeah. One of yeah, my yeah. favorites. Ethan Hawke. Marissa Tomei's in there. It shows her boobs. Oh, yeah. Like like in The Wrestler where she's got the titty piercings. That's a hot. Hell, yes. It's a hot. I watched it. It was good. It's uh, like uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman and Ethan Hawke are brothers. And they're both like, uh, you know, struggling and like with their lives and stuff. And they just decide like. Yeah, they're gonna rob a jewelry store, and they're gonna they're gonna do, rob the jewelry store that they both grew up working at because their parents own it. And it's like, oh yeah, we'll just do it. We'll we'll get out of there. We know where everything is. We'll be able to do it without hurting anybody. And then we'll, we'll be out of there, and, and nobody will get hurt. And uh, yeah, it's uh, like you know, it doesn't work out like they hoped, and uh, it's told in like a uh, you know a out of order kind of way. Like it's it was good. I I gave a very it. Pulp Fiction type thing. Yeah, kind of like uh, also like uh, what's that guy that did like Irreversible and stuff like that. It was okay. good though. 
So or they watch. I think we have to change it up a little bit. I might read a few because I'm looking at we haven't done this in two months and I have watched a lot of key shit. So I'm going to maybe like do a cluster and then you want to do it like that because it'll take a long yeah. time. Yeah. If we go back and forth, I'm still just going to pick. Like I, I mean, <laughs> like I could say I watched Kangaroo Jack, but I don't know if that's I did. I don't know if that's really worthy of giving like five minutes to. Yeah, I skip shit like that that I don't really have anything to say <laughs> unless I just did unless I really hate it. I, I do, I do, I will say something about Kangaroo Jack though because I actually watched this shit and uh, it was a five out of ten. It wasn't. I didn't hate it. I didn't like it. It was whatever. But you know what? I I was reading up on it as I was watching it because I like doing that. And uh, I guess that movie was a real big hit at the time. And why is it even called Kangaroo Jack? The fucking kangaroos in like one scene. That 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 was the controversy around it because it was false advertising. A lot of people got pissed because uh, I didn't. The the kangaroo is really just a plot device. (laughs) Well, no. So here's what happened. Um, The movie was filmed, done in the can, edited, all ready to go to fucking print. And it was an R rated fucking sex comedy. (laughs) Hundred percent. What? Uh, yes, it was R rated. It was raunchy. It was a sex comedy. And then, like, uh, when it kind of went to the powers that be and it went to test screenings, like, what the fuck? It, we can't sell this. Like, no one's gonna go see. It. And they decided there was that one scene in the middle of the movie where he trips balls and he sees like a kangaroo. And they're like, "That's your movie. Turn it into a kids' movie. PGify this. Edit it down. Like, take out all the dirty shit. See." Uh, that's what I miss about the 80s. Like, they would just be like, who cares if we can't sell it? Let's fucking put it out. And somebody will find it eventually. Because <laughs> the, cause the movie's not very long. It's like fucking like 80 minutes. So they probably hacked off 40 minutes of this. That was all the raunchy shit. Because it was done. They didn't do reshoots. The only thing they did was when they saw that kangaroo, like, hallucinated it. They're like, okay, we're going to make it about the kangaroo. And they hired the guy that played the kangaroo. They said, hey, you, come back. We're going to do an ad as you as the kangaroo selling this movie in post and that's what he did i'm kangaroo jack go see my movie they did that after the fact and they marketed as a fucking kids movie they they didn't reshoot the scene where the kangaroo's wearing his jacket and that has money in it or something they was that just part of it that just i i that i guess i don't know but from what i was reading and all the stuff and all the facts like no this thing was fucking done it was an r-rated raunchy comedy it was probably just a, a trivial thing that happened in the movie that they stretched out for the whole plot you know <laughs> but uh, i couldn't believe that like i've never seen um a workaround like that. I've never heard of a workaround quite like that cuz it and yeah, so people were pissed cuz they they had the ad, they were pre- pushing Kangaroo Jack like crazy and then people got pissed. There was only one scene in the whole movie where he had a voice because it's right. That's incredibly fucking stupid. That reminds me like uh like you remember with the Avengers of Pluto Nash and yeah. stuff they didn't know how to sell that and shit. Like wouldn't it be funny if at some point Hollywood just kind of like gets to the point where they're willing to be like, hey, man, the, the worst movie we've ever made. Come watch it. Come watch this fucking million dollar bullshit. We 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 didn't see this coming. Come watch it. Like <laughs> if they just went full of room, I'm like watch the biggest blunder of the last couple of years. I, I just could. They, they fooled me because I was watching it thinking this is like a really kitty movie with the talking kangaroo the whole time. And I'm I'm waiting for the kangaroo to talk. I keep singing kangaroo Jack. I'm like, OK, he's going to come alive. So never happens. And it finally happens like fucking an hour into the movie. And it's like for two seconds, like what the fuck is going on here? I watched that back when it came out on like DVD. Like there was, there was like a, <laughs> a, a summer where like kid movies that I actually enjoyed were coming out like that C spot run that had David Arquette in it yeah. with a fucking goofy ass, like stoner comedy haircut or whatever the fuck he had in that. Was he like a dog catcher? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> fuck it, David. Yeah. Man, look at me. I said we weren't going to talk about fucking uh, that movie for five minutes. But I'll be damned. We watched. We it talked about. Interesting. We talked about Kangaroo Jack. I know. I felt like I had to say it. Um, I'm actually gonna like just kind of mention the movies I watched and maybe my overall score. I'm not gonna go into them. Uh, I watched that Mark Wahlberg movie, Patriots Day, about the Boston uh, Marathon bombing. Uh, mm. You know, I, I have a certain expectation when I see these biopics that capitalize on a tragedy just a couple years after it happened. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I kind of go into them with a little bit of a like, eh, but I really enjoyed it. Even though I knew the outcome, and like I said, it's so fresh in memory that I know exactly what happened. Um, it was actually really, really good. So um, I gave it like an 8 out of 10. I liked it a lot, actually. I want to say the guy that did that is like 30 minutes away from me in prison. Maybe I'm thinking of a di- No, it was that Dylan Roof kid or whatever. I don't know who that is. Roof. Uh, he did something else. I forgot. But yeah, you know, Patriot's Day, I'd say it's a good like dinner movie. If you just want to like eat dinner with your woman or something, just watch it. It's good. It's whatever. Uh, I watched Sleepless in Seattle. I mean, I know it's a rom-com. It's one I never seen. Obviously, it's one of the more famous ones. Mm-hmm. It's a six. It's all right. I think it's aged. Mm-hmm. 
aged a little bit. Um, and I'll end with a movie that I think was a, a big one that I want to talk about for a moment. And then we'll take a break and go to you. Mm-hmm. Um, I finally watched the master, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. I okay. Like so, and Paul Thomas Anderson, I really hit or miss with, I haven't seen all his movies, but, and I kind of want to watch boogie nights again. Cause I know that was like his, his first big splash, but I watched boogie nights when it first came out to Cinemax. So like in the nineties, when it first dropped, like late nineties, I remember being entertained by it. But it I remember like, uh, yeah, I remember being really, I remember really digging it when I was a kid, but that might've been just me being younger and impressed, impressionable from all the drugs and booze and tits like <laughs> maybe yeah. that, but anyway, now that, and also maybe that was kind of before he really evolved into the PT Anderson that we kind of know now. So I, I, I would like to go back and watch that again, but um, I watched the master and I've been on a walking kick right lately. Cause I've been trying to watch a lot of his movies and I, and I think he's always awesome. And mm-hmm. this is really no, and, and your boys in it, right? Heroin overdose guy, fucking Philip Seymour Hoffman. Come well, out of your ears. He was in Boogie Nights too. Yeah. He's in Boogie Nights. And uh, it's so funny how Philip Seymour Hoffman, he hit mainstream so late in his career, right? Even to the point where if you watch family guy, they make a pop culture reference to that fat guy from Boogie Nights. They don't even call him Philip Seymour Hoffman, mm-hmm. right? This is before he was famous and he won that Oscar for Capote and all that shit. Um, like literally in one of the first couple seasons of Family Guy, they're like, oh yeah, you just look like that fat guy from Boogie Nights. And it, and it showed like, and like, they didn't even know his name at the time. Like he wasn't a household mm-hmm. name. But um, I just remember in that movie, he kissed Mark Wahlberg. Like, I'm sorry. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, in but- the car or whatever. No, and the car was different. The car was- uh, he was doing money, making like money on the side by just like prostitution work. Right. Cause I think mm-hmm. he was like a faded, faded thing, faded starlet. And I remember he got into a car and he's like, he was going to start getting busy, but the guy's like, no, 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 I'm not a fag or anything. I just like to watch. And, oh, and he yeah. makes Marky Mark like jack off for him. And he's like watching. And then they, then a bunch of guys just end up jumping him and beating the shit out of him or something. That's kind of what I remember. But, um, anyway, the master, what a fucking acid trip of a movie this was. So. Mm-hmm. I, it was one of those movies I was a little confused a, about how I felt about it at the end of it. Mm-hmm. And I, and I had to really marinate on it for a while. And at the end of the day, I gave it a seven out of 10. Uh, part of me, there's like, there's a big part of me that wound up give it a higher score. But then like, I felt like, man, I felt like I'd be lying to myself if I did, because there's certain things about it. <laughs> like I didn't know what to, I don't know, man. It's just a fucking trip. I'm like, how often am I going to watch this movie again? I think that's usually where I like draw that line at a seven or an eight. Um, mm-hmm. but it was definitely an experience and I will say the movie's worth it just because the performances, Philip Seymour Hoffman's a fucking trip. And then, uh, of course, Joaquin's a trip. And I went into that movie blind. I had no idea what it was about. Mm-hmm. I had no, I, it was called the master and that's all I've ever known it by. And I walked in this movie called the master and I had no idea. It was like a period piece. I had no mm-hmm. idea it was about a fucking cult. So it unraveled in a very exciting way for me, because even when you meet Philip Seymour Hoffman, you really don't really get who he is when he's like on that like boat, you know, and he wakes up drunk and he starts talking to him. You just kind of get, Oh, this guy's an alcoholic. And they slowly quit peeling back layers to Philip Seymour Hoffman's character as it goes on. And you're like, Oh, and by the time they get to that little reception party where he's clearly making people drink Kool-Aid, right. We're, we're talking about his bullshit. It's like, Oh, you get another layer and you get another layer and it's, and it, it turns out pretty insane. And then there's a lot of, um, it's one of those movies where you want to Google it after and look at everybody's theories. Cause it's obviously one of those types of flicks that has a lot of subtext. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then there's a lot of like theories out there that are cool because you could honestly take one way or the other. Like he talks about the master, everybody has a master. And then people were interpreting the whole party scene where <laughs> his wife is like jerking him off in the bathroom, right? You cannot come, you cannot come, you can come, you know? And oh, it's yeah. like, some people were saying, well, that he has a really weird homoerotic, like bond with a uh, Joaquin and, and like maybe he, they, some people think he was gay and, and uh, his wife was like repressing that and charge. But then some people were like, no, it's like, every, he's just into that whole fucking Dom sub thing. And like that he, she's her, his master. And he's got this, I, who fucking knows. But all I know is you see Fiona Doris titties in it and her fucking vag. Remember that? I don't remember that. So she doesn't have any speaking lines, but she's one of the, his followers. Right. And she's in a couple, she's in the scenes kind of like just in the background as one of the group. And during that scene where Joaquin starts imagining everybody at the party naked, all the women. Remember that? Mm-hmm. Uh, she's mm-hmm. one of them, clear as day, right in the corner, butt ass naked with her vag, like dancing all sexy, tits and everything. Like, what the fuck? I'm like, that's Fiona Dorof. And I, and I double checked and I Googled it and it was her. 
Like it's very oh, interesting. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a fucking trip, man. It's definitely worth a watch. And I take it back though. I I, I said I don't know how if I'm going to watch it again. It at the same time, it's a movie. I feel like later on, I have to revisit it because I think I'll have a different opinion. Do you know who he was like supposed to be? Certainly not a Jim Jones type. He was uh, it was like L. Ron Hubbard. It was about Scientology. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And I read about that too. It was like a lot of parallels about like Scientology bullshit and stuff like that. Um, yeah, yeah. It was. Yeah, I went into it knowing because uh, we talked about it on that episode of uh, where our boy Lucas was on, and he, uh, he yeah, he, he said that was part of the plot, so I already knew it going in. I had no clue. I mean, it was called the Master. That's quite uh, an ambiguous title. I'm like, what is this guy like? A black belt? Is he going to master karate? I don't know what. Is he, what is he? I, fucking master of his domain. So it was. Mm-hmm. It was cool. It was a cool experience because of that. Because it's not very often, especially a big movie like that that had like Oscar buzz and big director behind it and big stars that you don't know anything about it. So um, anyway, but I, from what I heard though, in the feedback, I, I always leave my review and my rating and all that shit. And then afterwards I'll go on letterbox and read everybody else's opinion after I put mine to see kind of where everybody stands. And uh, a general consensus for the movie is people like it, but even like the hardcore PT Anderson fans are kind of like, it's the least of his movies, but it's still better than everybody else. You know, that kind of movie. So mm. I, I don't, I can't really add to that because I'm not like a Paul Thomas Anderson fanboy. Like I don't really, I don't like punch drunk love that much. It's just all right. Mm-hmm. This was better than punch drunk love, but I, but I liked it. Yeah. Your turn. Oh yeah. We were talking about uh, Alex winter who plays bill and bill and Ted. Uh, he's actually, he makes a lot of documentaries now. And I watched his latest one, Showbiz Kids, on uh, HBO. And uh, it's basically about uh, child uh, actors. And they uh, they touch on, like, uh, you know, like, getting uh, taken advantage of and shit. Like, uh, Evan Rachel Wood's in there. Mm. Uh, the girl that played Matilda. Uh, Mila Jovovich. And Will Wheaton. Mara Wilson. Mara Wilson, Ma- Mara Wilson was, um yeah, the girl. Yeah. Did uh, Evan Rachel Wood was did she like go up against like Marilyn Manson like he took advantage of me he's an old fucking nasty perv? Yeah, I heard that. I, I, I never saw anything about it, but somebody mentioned that recently. Well, because she like, was she wasn't a child, but it might have been a situation where he was taking care, you know, taking advantage of someone much because she was like eighteen, she was young, you know. Mm, but, yeah, Todd Bridges was in there. Fucking Todd Bridges. It was worth a watch, and uh, I watched. Uh, I'm, I'm, I mentioned uh, Irreversible uh, before. The guy that made that is Gasper Noe. He, I, I watched another movie of his called I Stand Alone. I stand alone! Okay. Hell yeah. I'm going to wake up my naffin' lady. <laughs> She's like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> but yeah, that was a fucking uh, really uncomfortable to watch. It's basically like, uh, it's like Taxi Driver, but like... Uh, it's basically like all those movies that are like, we're going to show you a really fucking just disturbed human being. And uh, it's a character study of him. And it's this fucking guy, like the entire movie is his inner monologue. And he's just, he's fucking crazy. And then like the way it ended was like really mean spirited. And like, yeah, it was fucked up. Like, I don't know. Maybe I'll, I'll we'll visit it someday on the show. I'm sure you'd hate it though. <laughs> yeah, it'd be interesting to hear. Uh, oh, I watched. Uh, you ever hear of Vice Academy? I've heard of it. I've never seen it. They're basically like fucking uh, C grade fucking versions of Police Academy, and like it was starring like Linnea Quigley and Ginger Lynn. And look, Linnea Quigley's only in the first two, and then like she wouldn't come back for like three. I watched the first three of them. Yeah, they were they were entertaining. Like nothing like. You know, it was just like, yeah, I was entertained throughout. And then, like, uh, part three was like, eh. Ginger Lynn peaked with the uh, Metallica Turn the Page video. Amazing. Because she's a stripper and she shows her titties in it. But it's funny because she peaked there, but that's when she was obviously past her prime in the porn industry, which is the point of the video. She uh, peaked when she was getting fucked by Captain Spaulding in the fucking Devil's Rejects. Yeah, that was after. <laughs> uh, that's when she turns oh, yeah. back into the fat chick. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Um, did you have any more? Or do you want me to go? Uh, I can mention one more. Uh, I watched a movie called Fat Girl. Oh, okay, relevant. Which was like, uh, so it's it's basically like a like a fucking uh, man. I, don't, I think it was made in Italy, and it was like 
I guess it was like some kind of feminist movie, which I I didn't know going into it. And it was uh, like, so it's basically like two, uh, like a 12 year old and a 15 year old girl. It starts out with like them, uh, the classic thing you see in all the sex comedies, like, oh yeah, I bet I can lose my virginity before you. So the whole plot of the movie is kind of like the the dark angle of that idea. So like the the 15 year old girl meets like a guy who's in like college and uh, he basically takes advantage of her and shit and like... uh, he ends up, uh, he pretty much rapes her. Like, uh, like she tells him, like, oh, I don't want to have sex. I want to save myself from marriage. And he's like, oh, well, I can do you in the butt. And then it's okay, because it's like, it's not real. And she's like, yeah, I don't know. But he, he just kind of does it while she's still, like, saying no. And then, like, uh, it's really weird, because, uh, like, it goes on to, like, towards the end of the movie, the parents find out, and they get all pissed off at the daughter. And it's like... Why the fuck are you pissed off at her? Like, uh, the parents are stupid because, like, they uh, there's scenes where the, the, the kid is with the daughter eating, like, supper. And it's like, he's clearly way older than her. And they're just like, yeah, it's all good. It's uh, fine. They're just dating. But then whenever they find out, they get really pissed off at the daughter. Like, the mom just, they get in the car, start driving. And then, like, uh, uh, a spoiler alert, it ends with, like, they they stop somewhere and they're sleeping on the road and some like random guy just fucking like breaks through the windshield and kills them and then like rapes the title character the fat girl see the fat girl's like uh she's always like the one that's always kind of the third wheel with the older sister who's more popular and shit like there's a scene where uh the girl's talking about like you know I don't want to have sex with him I want to save myself for marriage because you know I want that one time to be special but then the fat girl she's like uh You know, if anything, I want somebody that's going to have sex with me and then just leave because, you know, I know it's, I know that's just how it's going to turn out. I don't want any bullshit and stuff like that. So like the end of it, she actually gets raped by the guy and it goes full circle and she got what she wanted. It it was weird. And like, I'm thinking like, yeah, that was fucking, that was weird. And, uh, like I was reading through it. I'm like, cause like the ending of it, I was like, I was just like fucking it didn't make any sense. Why did they get in the car and start driving? It just seemed like they needed to get from A to B. And then I'm reading up on it, and I'm like, okay, maybe it's just something with the culture I don't understand. But then I get to a point where I read that, like, oh, yeah, uh, the the main character, the girl, they, she, they were really 12 and 15 years old. And they're uh, I'm like, oh. And, it, like, basically back then it was okay to have nudity from, like, 12 and 15-year-olds. And then I'm just like, fuck this movie. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> so the actresses were really 12 and 15? Yeah, so there was nudity from like a twelve and fifteen year old movie, like in the movie. I'm just like, whoa, fuck whoa, whoa, this whoa. movie. Who made this? Where'd this movie come from? What country? I think France or something. Yeah. Oh, and the one that got raped by the older guy was the twelve or the fifteen year old. Twelve year old. And how old was the guy supposed to be? I don't know. Probably in his thirties. Dude, fucking brute. And the actor looked like it was. Hmm. Fuck, dude. Well, I'm gonna jump ahead. Just because it's relevant to what you just watched, speaking of uh, that kind of thing, you know, the, the whole exploitation of children or at least sexualizing them, I finally watched Leon the Professional. Uh, I love that movie. I love it too. And, and it, <laughs> you kind of feel dirty liking it because obviously Natalie Portman, uh, you, you know, she speaks against it all the time and what they did to her, you know, as far as sexualizing her at a young age. And I didn't know she did. I didn't know she talked oh, about it. Oh, yeah, yeah. In all this, like, um, you know, uh, in her in her later days here, she's become quite the outspoken feminist type, right? Going to the rallies, doing the whole thing. I remember she was she's she was one of the people spearheading the Me Too movement, right? With the Rose mm-hmm. McGowan's and all that stuff. And she was that was one of her main points of topic was uh, how she was sexual. And I don't know if she ever called the movie out by name, but she said she was sexualized from the age of twelve. We all know what movie she's talking about. Uh, yeah, I could I could see it being like, oh yeah, they definitely sexualized me in the movie, but. They never like implied that that was a good thing. Like he stayed away from her and stuff, didn't he? Well, remember right? Yeah, Uh, but a well, the original script they changed the original script. No, it was more implied. Oh, yeah. I I I was looking online. I was catching the original script. In the original script, they um, I think there's a director's cut. The original script's like the most on the fucking nose. The director's Mm. cut. They give you a little more, and then the cut that you've probably seen is the one where it's like everything's just kind of implied. You know, you don't really get anything. So mm-hmm. the intent was probably there. The, the script, though, the script they actually have sex. 
Mm. And there, and I read it, man. I was like, there was a scene where she's like in bed with him and she's saying, I want you to be my first and whatever. And they're, and, and he gives into the temptation. So when you know that that's where the story started, it makes you interpret how he is in the movie. Like, okay, is he, is he um, being apprehensive because he's awkward and he wants to do the right thing? Or is he apprehensive because he doesn't want to give into these urges that he feels? Mm-hmm. That's the way I kind of watched the movie after that. I'm like, so it's oh. like a modern day Lolita. Yeah, it really is taking a few pages from the Lolita handbook. But um, anyway, so and I, I believe there's a director's cut that that extends the scenes. Like, you know, the scene where she's going to the uh, the, the hotel, the concierge. Right. And after it's been a long time. OK, so. He comes into the hotel after that, you know, the house was shot to shit, the apartment complex or whatever they lived at. And they, he stays with their hotel when he agrees that, hey, I'm going to teach you to be an assassin, right? I'm going to teach you to be a professional or a cleaner, as they call it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, he's giving her lessons and they're up in the hotel and he just tells the concierge, like, whatever, I'm a, what does he say? Uh, He's a conductor, musician, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a scene where he goes, tells her to stay. She comes down. I think they maybe just had a squabble, like him and her and Leon. And after he leaves, she comes down and she leaves and she talks to the concierge and he's making small talk. Like, oh, is your dad like, uh, where is he at today? He's like, oh, he's like asking about his job. And she's like, oh, Mm -hmm. he's a conductor. He's this. And then she goes, he's like, well, actually, she goes, he's like, she's trying to make trouble. He's like, actually, he's not, he's not my, really my dad. He's my lover. And she starts, he gets, Mm -hmm. and that's what prompts him to call the cops and the authorities and they get kicked out. No one arrests him. They just get kicked out of the hotel. But Mm -hmm. there's a lot of, and then I guess in, um, there's another deleted scene. I think it's actually in a director's cut where there's a scene where she's in the shower. And, Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if he bumps into her in the shower naked or something like that. And she's trying to seduce him. Like, it's okay. You know, something, but there are iterations of this movie that take it deeper that make me realize, I mean, I don't know how you, how you categorize it. Do you go off the edit? Like, well, no, they edit it. So that stuff doesn't exist anymore. So it was meant to go either way, or do you acknowledge the edits were made? And it's like, okay, well, that's how I, I view this movie is supposed to be. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. it changes everything. It try watching it again after you do some research, but anyway, did you watch the director's cut or the, no, yeah. I didn't. I was reading about those. I didn't see any shower scene. I didn't see, um, I guess in that scene with the concierge that that's in the regular version where she says we're lovers and all that stuff. Um, and yeah, she, I think I remember. Yeah. That. And I then she, she said it just to like kind of fuck with him, make him mad or something. Yeah. Like, uh, she's yeah. The lovers. Yeah. Like maybe trying to get back and she says things like, I think I'm in love with you. They keep it, uh, you know, ambiguous, right? You know, he's always uncomfortable, but you could take it either way. Like, okay, he's uncomfortable because he feels like an obligation to help her, mm-hmm. but he doesn't want to cross these weird lines. But, or like I said, you could, you could interpret it as, wow, this guy is a really lonely guy and he's developing feelings for, her, and he doesn't want to sub- succumb to, you know, those carnal urges. Right. Uh, but, but it's clear that it's like a love story because, you know, he clearly loves her at the end of the movie, but it's just how you interpret what that love is. Is it a father daughter thing? Is it a whatever? But eh, I think it goes a little deeper than that. But uh, no, I think in the director's cut, I didn't have a shower scene. There's that shower scene. And I think in the director's cut, she straight up does the thing where she asks him, she wants him to be his first. Mm. Right now. I don't know if in the director's cut it, it, they don't actually have sex, but I think maybe there's more of that. Like, you know, him passing it off or like saying whatever. Anyway, Mm -hmm. it's a good movie and it's kind of weird to say that, but the movie is good. I do think, I think they still would have had a good movie if she wasn't a kid because Mm -hmm. your, your main principle, the story is still there. You got a lonely guy that only lives to work, right? He, he's not close to anybody. His job doesn't let him get close to anybody. Uh, you know, he's like baby in that fucking FICA plan or whatever, the whole movie, that's his best friend. And you have another girl or another person that's lost everything as well. And they, you know, it's that classic story of two people, unlike an unlikely pair of people cross paths and they realize they needed each other. Right. It's, it's been done a lot, but I still think you have that chief story and them adding the fact that she's a little kid I don't I don't really know what that adds to the value of the story besides just making it a little bit more risque, Mm -hmm. you know, but whatever. It's a French director. That's fucking his thing. But the movie was awesome. Anyway, you can go Mm -hmm. next. Sorry. Um, that might be all since the last time. Oh, okay. Well, I got more, man. I got a big one. You want to hear my big one? Uh, My big one 
is, uh, and I think this is going to be a long episode of Cinema Enema, but you guys deserve it. It's been. Oh a- no, I found one that I. Can okay, watch. go ahead. Go ahead. I watched that. It's on uh, Netflix. It's got Brian Cranston. It's that Trumbo movie. Oh yeah, I've been wanting to watch that about Dalton Trumbo. Yeah, Johnny, get your gun and shit. It's about the whole like uh, McCarthy era, like uh, freak out, like oh, we don't like these people. They. Uh, it was basically a time whenever like you know thought crimes were a thing. So just like having somebody accuse you of being a communist would like ruin your career in Hollywood, I guess. And so like yeah, it was good. I liked it and. Uh, it's been a while since I watched it, so I can't really tell you a lot about it. Well, I, yeah, I remember liking it. Okay, so you didn't like it that much if you can't remember it, but it was good. I, I watch a lot of stuff, though, so it'd be unfair to hold that against it. It's been in my watch list for a while. Uh, the big one that I watched was Dr. Sleep. I finally watched it. I, oh, yeah, I remember being kind of like uh, like I was really looking forward to, because I didn't even know who Trumbo was before going into it. So Johnny, get your it, gun. Yeah, the filmmaker and stuff like that. Yeah, so like uh, whenever I was going in to watch it, I was like, oh, this is the guy that did Spartacus. Maybe uh, there's going to be a part of the movie where they're talking about how hard it was to work with Stanley Kubrick because he's like known as like this super hard to get along with guy if you're like the writer of a book that he's adapting or whatever. So, yeah, they touched on it, but it, it wasn't a big part of the movie. Well, yeah, go ahead. And, I, and I've always known the name Dalton Trumbo because once again, Six Degrees Metallica, the one video is off the movie adaptation of Johnny Get Your Gun, you know, his work. So mm-hmm. whatever. Mm-hmm. But anyway, yeah, I finally watched Dr. Sleep and I was I was hesitant to get around to watching it because Zach didn't like it very much. Um, and I, you know, I, I, reading the online stuff about it, it seemed like it was very polarizing, very split. Right. Mm-hmm. And so. You know, that's, I don't know. I do want to watch it again. I gave it a six. Uh, Like whenever I get something like kind of, it it doesn't hit my expectations. I tend to like make it sound like I didn't like it more than I actually, you know, did. Well, and then I, uh, and I think I was also kind of hesitant as well because, you know, it's a really long movie and I'm like, oh man, it's a really long movie. And I kind of hear it. I hear some people say it's kind of boring. I'm like, oh, do I really want to get this started? I got to be a right headspace for it, you know? But um, you watch the extended cut. No, you can watch that on uh, HBO too. Well, I'm glad I didn't watch it because I, I don't know if that's sometimes when I watch extended cuts first, it's not the best impression because a lot of extended cuts aren't better, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, and it was already so long as it is. But um, I watched it and I was pleasantly surprised. I gave it an eight. I really, really enjoyed it. And Mm -hmm. I enjoyed it because it really did its own thing. And I know it's going off a source material in a book, but it really did its own thing. It didn't, uh, it didn't rest on the shining, you know, obviously it's got fan service too, which I found more enjoyable than I thought I would. I mean, yeah, it's, it was a little off putting to watch Elliot from ET play Jack Nicholson. Cause that's who that was under the prosthetic Mm -hmm. nose and shit. Yeah. I don't think he did a terrible job. No, I don't think he. I don't think he nailed the Jack Nicholson impression at all. I mean, that was he. He. Mm. he they. They. They were doing the part, the angles, and the hair and stuff. I. It kind of blew me away because I'm like, there's got to be a billion people out there, like professional imitators, that could do a Jack Nicholson impersonation. He's actually a big part of Showbiz Kids too. Oh yeah, I bet he is. He kind of like he got blackballed by Hollywood because apparently it, it came out that his. He didn't put his out. Mom was hard. No, his mom was hard to work with. So then, by default, he was hard to work with because his mom was like really worried about him getting like all that stuff a kid needs and not becoming too much of a kid star or yeah. something at the time. Which, by the way, I actually I rewatched ET a couple nights ago. I've I've watched that a few times. I've never liked it, and I watched it again. I'm like, yeah, I still don't love this movie. It's still a. I give that movie a six. And the only reason I give it a six and not a five is just because I appreciate what it did for the time and how, and it kind of changed the landscape for blockbusters. Dude, you got to see Thomas Howe before he did blackface. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, so back to Dr. Sleep. Um, yeah, I, I was afraid it was going to be a cash grab, like as far as like uh, lo- relying too heavily on these nostalgic scenes and, I didn't get that vibe at all. I thought it was all pretty well paced, and I and I thought the build up going back to the the outlook, uh, sorry, the Overlook Hotel was was really cool, and it was really welcome. And by the time they had worked Did up, it to make that, you think of uh, of Metal Gear Solid Four at all, where they go back to Shadow Moses? Shadow Moses. That's what it made me think of the whole time. It didn't, but now it does. Uh, <laughs> now it does. Yeah, and you're seeing all like the premonitions and all the flashbacks. Yeah, yeah, dude. I guess it does. So that's gonna fuck with me now. But I liked it, man. I thought it was cool. And I even liked the. I felt like um, 
they obviously had to connect it to the original movie, right? Because the movie is such a huge part of pop culture with the Jack Nicholson's and all that stuff. So they were connecting it there. But if you if you kind of like take away that, this movie was way more Stephen King than it was Stanley Kubrick. <laughs> Yeah, it was closer. Yeah, yeah, with the wackiness of the those fucking weird little vampire things. Those like vampire that sucked energy or they suck the essence of people. Yeah. yeah, that was very Stephen King, where it's got all these batshit ideas in it that are just you know throw everything at the wall and yeah, actually fuck it, we're gonna take everything that hits the wall. We're not gonna see what sticks. But it worked yeah. really cool. It it felt more like a Stephen King novel come to life. And, um, you know, I liked all the characters. I thought Ewan McGregor did a good job. He was cool in it. Um, I even kind of liked the the bad guys. The characters were kind of fun. I kind of liked all of them. And even though they were kind of batshit and kind of weird. Um, and I thought they tied the guy they got to play. Scatman Carruthers was a fucking dead ringer. He was. Oh, yeah. It's like I had to like blink. I'm like, is this CGI? No, it's another actor. I'm like, fuck. Like, why couldn't they get a guy? Like this for Jack Nicholson, because it's like, fuck, I, I wonder if Jack Nicholson would have did it today and they could have deep faked his face. Mm-hmm. No, but uh, see, I remember when that came out, people were like, and I kind of thought this way, too. Like, uh, it's the same director who did that. Uh, My, Mike Flanagan. That's why Elliot's in it. Is it Haunting on Hill House? Yeah. Haunting of Hill House. Oh. Elliot's in that, too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so like he did he, Oculus. Uh, he did Oculus, too. Mike Flanagan. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, I, I like like he he's uh, he does some good stuff. And I remember like. I remember thinking, like, you know, Haunted on Hill House, it could have been, like, cut down to uh, a feature-length movie and probably ran better, whereas this movie could have been, like, you know, bulked up to, like, a miniseries and probably ran better. I remember thinking that, and I remember people were saying the same thing. Whenever that, that's funny you put that out there. I think this movie would make a great miniseries. Yeah. You could probably take the director's cut if it's, like, more bloated and make it a miniseries. That is an, uh, a, a very uh, new... Uh, News story, they are apparently going to make a series for some the, TV. The Overlook Hotel, where it's just based by yeah. the... the ah, ah, fuck. Um, yeah. I, I think that's just such low-hanging fruit. Like, come on, guys. Mm-hmm. You know that idea has been pitched around a million times. It, 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 oh, it's yeah, I, it's just... Everybody wants to take every established property and milk the fuck out of it. And it's weird because I, I, I'm i trashing it now for its... TV drama is where it's at, though. They always I know. To- I Well, I, like I'm saying, I'm trashing it now because of its lack of fucking creativity. But at the same time, Base Motel was awesome. Mm-hmm. Right? So it's like, ah. Uh, so who knows? But yeah, I really liked it, man. And now I'd like to own it. And now I, w- I will watch the director's cut because I because I'd be into. But I thought everything wrapped well together. I didn't think it felt as long as it did. I th- I didn't. It, to mm-hmm. me, it went by fast. It was fun. I didn't find any lulls in it. And I, but I will say though, like when when you're uh, the the Shelley Long impersonators kind of put me off. I had to I had to suspend disbelief, right, and just kind of deal with it. Shelley Duvall. Shelley Duvall, not Shelley Long. Sorry, it's Cheers. Uh, <laughs> Shelley Duvall. It put me off a little bit because, but at least that actress was doing her best Shelley Duvall impress- pers- impersonation with her voice. Daddy, mm-hmm. Daddy Jack, but the the Jack the Elliot really wasn't doing much of a Jack Nicholson impression. So I found her to be a little off putting, but not nearly as much as Jack Nicholson. He was off putting me a little bit. So I'm glad they didn't. They never showed him really dead on. If you notice, I think they kind of kept him at a profile. You know what I mean? Um, mm-hmm. They tried to do stuff with angles, but yeah, like I'm glad they didn't have him in the movie more because it would have been a really off putting. So it wasn't too bad, but he was distracting. But Scatman Carruthers knockoff. I felt right at home with that guy because he looks so much like Scatman. He sounded so much like Scatman that every scene with him was cool, man. So I think it was just down to getting a guy that could really pull it off. I don't know. Oh, yeah. But I fucking dug it. I dug it. His hometown is 30 minutes away from me. Yeah. Why do they call him Scatman? Scatman. I shudder to think why they call him Scatman. I don't want to know. He was a, he was a musician that did that. You mean he didn't yeah. like to get, oh, that he liked to get shit on? Or just scat. And he and he took shits on people's chests. Hopefully. All right. Um, briefly, I'll just kind of run over these really quick. I watched that Amazon original movie with Joseph Gordon Levitt, seventy five hundred. Have you seen that advertised? Like when you're passing by and shit. I don't think so. It's a little indie flick. It's a it's a co production. I believe it's a um, fuck. Was it German or French or some European country and, and, and the States? So 
it takes place in this foreign country. I can't for the life of me remember what it is. Let's we'll just call it Germany. It takes place there. And it's about a pilot who's an American, Joseph Gore Levitt, Levitt. And he's married to like a German girl. Let's say they're from Germany. And it's he's he's a he's a pilot on a German airline. Mm-hmm. So in the rest of the cast is German, right? Uh, anyway, it's a very, very, very indie movie. And the whole movie takes place in a fucking cockpit. Like it, the oh. movie starts off with them taking off and you know you see people coming in and out of the cockpit you see one of the stewardess come in and it turns out to be joseph gordon levitt's levitt's wife she's a stewardess on the, the flight on the airline and um the flight gets taken over by terrorists oh and and it's an interesting take because they never really show you the cabin they you know when the door opens and you can see stuff through cameras through their monitors in the in the cockpit and stuff about what's going on a little bit but they never leave the cockpit and it's all from their point of view. It's all like from the Joseph Gordon Levitt Levitt. Like, you know, hey, we got a we got a fucking shit storm going on right now. How do I handle a crisis situation? Right. And he mm-hmm. he locks the cockpit because he's you know, they're making demands. Let us in the cockpit. Let us in the cockpit because they want to fucking crash the plane. Mm-hmm. And he doesn't. He's like locking it up. And and of course, they start raising the stakes. You know, they're threatening to kill people. Right. If he doesn't open it up, but he's got it. He can't open it up because it's like, yeah, he doesn't want that person to get fucking stabbed. They got by the neck because he's watched him on a little black and white monitor. But at the same time, it's like, why would I why would I give you the cockpit when you're just going to kill everybody? That doesn't make any sense. Like you're making mm-hmm. this decision hard, but easy. And then, of course, they keep up in the ante and eventually they get his wife. Right. Mm-hmm. Spoiler alert. He still does the right thing and doesn't open the cockpit mm-hmm. and they kill her. And it's just and uh, I, I enjoyed it. I, I look at small movies like this in a different way. Um, I think. Uh, I was reading the reviews for it after I watched it. And I think people were being a little bit harsh on it. Like they were kind of giving it like fives and stuff. I gave it a seven. I'm like, dude, they fucking made an indie movie and it was short. They kept it at like 85, 90 minutes, but it was pretty riveting the whole time for it being in a cockpit. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. like it, it was a, I'd say it's a good little flick. If you want to check it out. I, I was, they did suspense really well. And like I said, I'm usually thoroughly, thoroughly impressed when these movies like that have like one location, you know, you watch a movie like, you watch a movie like cube, right? You've seen that original cube movie. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's yeah. not even technically one location. They just filmed it on one location and kept making you think it was a different room over and over and over again. So even they mm-hmm. had like an, an, an advantage. This was all in a fucking cockpit and it's, it, so I, I would watch it if you got time. It's, it's definitely a solid flick and he does a good job. What else did I watch? Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to, there's a bunch of shit. I'm going to pass over a bunch of shit though. Cause I'm running out of time. Fire in the sky. I finally watched that. Hell yes. Um, uh, a UFO guy. I love that shit. And uh, I think I mentioned this on another podcast, but basically I've always wanted to watch this and I never did. I see ads for it all the time and, and pretty much everybody talks about the uh, spacecraft scene, right? Mm-hmm. It's notorious. This is one of those movies that I had uh, implanted like permanent memory. I almost said implanted memory, speaking of aliens, but no, I had a permanent memory of seeing this as a kid and then being like fucking scared by that scene where he wakes up and it puts the gel in his mouth. The jelly or whatever. Or whatever. So yeah. if you take out that scene, because the scene everybody's talking about happens in the third act of the movie, like towards the end of the movie, like, you, 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 but it, it lasts, man. It's like 10 minutes long. It's quite long. And, uh, mm-hmm. but if you remove that and they, the thing is they didn't have to put that there. They didn't have to put that mm-hmm. there because it's after he wakes up and he comes back to the guy that supposedly disappeared. And then we get this whole flashback sequence and it's cool. So technically they didn't have to give that to us, but it makes the movie because uh, when you remove that, it's a melodrama, right? It's it's more about um, mm-hmm. the town, the small town in Arizona, Snowflake, Arizona, of them turning on the survivors, right? Because they think they killed their friend because he disappeared. Then mm-hmm. and, and it's just really kind of about that, like a, a suspicion thing. and. You know, and it's still a good movie. I think um, I I enjoyed it. I think uh, if you take out the flashback stuff and you just would have kept it as that melodrama, I, I would give it a six. Right. It's still decent. It's got a who's who of 90s almost became a list leading men, but didn't quite make the mark. You know, it's got mm-hmm. fucking look at it, Elliot from E.T. We keep coming back to him. Right. Dog. Um, It's got dude. I fucking never thought I'd be talking about. uh. Why can't I think of his name? Thomas. What's his fucking name? Uh, not sure. Yeah, I, I fucking know it. And I can never spit it out because I always want to say Thomas Elliot. But Elliot. Anyway, he's in that too. I can't fucking believe it. Robert Patrick is kind of the lead, right? And then you have D.B. Sweeney as the guy that gets abducted. He was a 90s guy too. You know, he was in Spawn. 
and he was he was a leading man actually in in like a, a bunch of movies before Spawn. But uh, and he wasn't. He was obviously second fiddle in Spawn. And then you got who else do you got? You have Craig Sheffer, right from uh, fucking Cabal, Nightbreed, right? Uh, mm-hmm. So all these guys that were like the who's who of '90s guys, and James Garner's in it too. Uh, but so I enjoy it for that sense because I like any movies that are in the early '90s and remind me of the early '90s. And I like seeing Robert Patrick young and healthy, you know, like T1000 looking. And anyway, but that fucking scene at the end though that everybody talks about, it, it gives it a whole nother star. It's like seven. It's it's really good because in this thing. It kind of comes out of left field because even watch this movie for an hour and 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and you don't think they're going to go there because it's more of a melodrama. Then all of a sudden you get this crazy fucking out of left field science fiction experience and you get to relive what he did. And it's creepy, man, as a guy that is a grown man now. And I didn't see it when I was a kid. Uh, it, all the hype that it's always had lives up to it because I found it generally creepy and the effects were all practical. I could tell the fucking aliens, like, you know, him waking up and he's got these little men over him doing their thing, shoving the jelly in his mouth, all that stuff you're talking about. Mm-hmm. They look fucking heinous. Like they look creepy as fuck. I don't think I've seen a creepier alien on screen. And uh, yeah, you get to see him try and escape and, you know, him going through the ship and seeing all these other cargoes of like skeletons and people <laughs> of that were abducted. And it's just, yeah. it's pretty fucked up. I remember as a kid being like, what's happening to him? And he's like, oh, he's abducted by aliens. They're doing experiments on him, my dad. And I'm like, does that happen often? Could that happen to me? And he's like, oh, it does. <laughs> because and they have that thing where they're like, like prying his eye open and that little needle's going to go in his eye. Like, oh, he always tried to scare me with that shit. Yeah, yeah it, it's 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 worth it. So I would say definitely if you're into paranormal shit like UFO stuff, watch it. It's one of those movies I can't believe I haven't watched yet. But um, if you want to cheat, I'm sure that scene's online. I'm pretty sure you can find that scene on YouTube, right? Just isolated. Were you, were you thinking of Henry Thomas? Henry Thomas, yes. Because I always want to go Elliot Thomas or Thomas Elliot. I can't fucking spit it out. He's that to me. He's fucking Elliot. I look at him like I mm. cannot not say your name. But uh, Henry Thomas, he's also in the Legends of the Fall, which I love. Um, Is that the actor you couldn't remember? His yeah, name Hen- Henry it? Thomas. That's it. Elliot. All right. Yeah, I always want to say Elliot Thomas. But anyway, because he still looks like fucking Elliot, dude. He still looks like him. Oh, yeah. Anyway, I watched um, Panic Room for the first time. I watched that, uh, which is. Fucking what's his name? Who did that? Uh, that was a uh, Fincher. Fincher. Um, I think uh, it was a seven. I uh, I'd say it's a good movie and it was a really i think it's one of the more basic fincher movies right it's him kind of doing a very by the numbers type of home invasion movie the only thing i remember about that was there was a character with like uh cornrows and that year during the mtv movie reviews like jack black and uh, sarah michelle geller hosted it and they did a parody of that and jack black had the cornrows yeah it was a big hit that's jared leto's character no, um, no, it's actually, it's a really good movie. I really enjoyed it. But like when I watch a David Fincher movie, I, I expect a little bit extra, like, you know, seven's not your typical psychological thriller. It's got a certain flair to it. Um, and, uh, the social network has a, has a certain flair to it. This movie felt like just him doing a pretty by the numbers, but good break in movie. Like it didn't seem special. But it was good. I, I gave it a seven. It was fine. Um, I liked the cast. I love Forrest Whitaker. Jared Leto was fine in it too. Dwight Yoakam was fucking good and creepy. Uh, and they cast, but no, he does guitars and Cadillacs and he'll belly you. Yeah. Oh, for, I forgot he was in that. Yeah, yeah. He's like the he's like the recluse, right? He's the guy that's really kind of a a live wire. Right. The unpredictable guy. Anyway, it was good, but I think it's um, it's not as good as a seven. It's not like the movie seven where it's it's really memorable. Uh, I even like Gone Girl. I think Gone Girl does the whodunit really well. Like that's a really powerful movie. Social Network's better, but it's not as worst movie. Benjamin Button is. Fuck that movie. Never seen that one. And I was looking up reviews, too, and a lot of people seem to think, a lot of Fincher fans were saying that, too. Like, it's kind of the least of his movies, but I thought it was really- Well, the least of his movies, probably Alien 3. No, people were like, we don't count Alien 3. That's what they're saying. Oh, okay. <laughs> they were like, not even- uh, Yeah, yeah well, you know what? There you go. Technically, and I don't hate Alien 3. I'm, I'm kind of an apologist in that regard. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it was a good movie. It wasn't boring. It was fast-paced. It just felt like a popcorn movie. It felt like the movie you go see on a Saturday night. You're like, oh, what movie are we going to see? Let's go see that new Panic Room movie. And you go see it, and you're riveted by it, and you enjoy it. And you talk a little bit at the diner afterwards, but then you forget about it. 
you know. Mm-hmm. Anyway, uh, to get this going, I finally watched um, The Babysitter, that Netflix movie from a couple of years ago. It's for a boogeyman to be killed by the babysitter. <laughs> okay. The Babysitter with uh, Alex Winter's daughter and Bill and Ted 2, Bill and Ted 3. She plays the babysitter. She's kind of a babe in the yeah, movie. Yeah, yeah. And, and the movie was a lot of fun. It was actually a surprise. I'm like, oh, this is... You know, obviously a very self-aware type homage, and it was it was a lot of fun. It was super short. Mm-hmm. It was just nonstop kind of like laughs and fun kills. I watched it back when it came out, and I think I, I mentioned it. We talked uh, about like we were joking because like, it, was, it was directed by Mick G. Yeah, Mick G. <laughs> That f- yeah, fucking guy that salvation made the fucking Terminator salvation, and it, it actually reminds me a lot of uh, the Shudder original movie. Uh, I forget what it was called. Damn it. Okay, I'll, I'll figure it out. I'll go ahead and talk about it. Yeah, yeah. I think I'm thinking too. Like I'm on onto something. I can't quite put my finger on it. What you're talking about, but yeah. But I watched that. I watched that fucking rom com with the the chick from uh, Amelia Clark. That last Christmas movie. <laughs> you know, that mm-hmm. was better than I thought it was going to be. You know, it was alright. It was a six. Uh, Amelia Clark's a babe. Yeah, it was. It was a fun movie. Well, it takes place in London. I'm a sucker for like. I love London, so it's kind of cool seeing all locations. And she was good in the movie. Uh, other than that, it's kind of a by the numbers, very predictable story. But you know, that's not always that doesn't always equal a fucking worthless movie. You know, um, what else did I see? Um, kind of skip that, skip that, skip that, skip that. Better watch out is the one I'm thinking of. Did I watch? I say check it out. It's pretty fun if you like the babysitter. Okay, better watch out. Okay, remind me after we're done recording. Maybe I'll watch that. Don't watch any trailer about it though. It, it ruins it. Okay, so remind me after we're done recording this, and I'll watch it tonight. Actually, all right. So that's that's all I'm going to say for my my watches because obviously the other new movies I've watched lately are the subject of our fucking podcast. Which I guess we're going to go to a break and we're going to talk about the Coffin Joe trilogy. Whoa, oh, 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 oh. Coffin Joe. My blood is immortal. There is no oh, yeah. God. My blood, all it is real is death and life. Okay, so we're going to come back. We're going to take a small break. Join us, and we're going to talk Cough and Joe. Peace. Uh, Super Bowl number 24. Returning to the White House this evening, the president was... My mother used to say to me all the time... House Speaker Tom Foley warned today that... A- Here comes Joe Montana. And has he been spectacular of late? And, and done a heck of a job in, in uh, you know, playing this. Inside Out Boy, what you want in a hero. Guts. Tonight, I'll take your soul. Uh, the bloody exorcism of Coffin Joe. The strange world of Coffin Joe. Uh, Porky Six. <laughs> <laughs> Kidding. All right. Um, is it stuff like we saw in the clip? Is it all that horror and... <laughs> Não, meus filmes têm muito horror, violência, tortura, muita dor e desbramamento. Desbramamento. The son of his movies have everything that's violent in the world. Pain, torture, suffering, even dismemberment. Pain, torture, suffering, and did you say dismemberment? Dismemberment. Desbramamento. Can you, can, yeah, can, can, you, can you show us? May, may I audition for uh, for one of your movies? May, may we? Pode fazer I would love to audition yeah. for it. I would love to. Uh, is that is that Yiddish or is that Portuguese? Portuguese. All right. Uh, so this is, uh, I guess, where you audition people. This would be the scene in the coffin. Yeah. Uh, Nighttime, please, 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 please get inside the coffin. Dirt from the graveyard? Yeah, sure. So this would be the dirt from the graveyard. You want to do the whole shovel then? Yeah, sure. All right, that's. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, no, I think I think we got that covered. Thank you. Dirt from the graveyard. Some verms now. Some, sorry? Verms. Verms? Yeah, slugs and bugs and things like that. I hop in a little bit. Slugs and bugs and stuff? If I hop in a little bit. Some worms now. What exactly am I auditioning for? Yeah, but I thought. 
Hey, uh, couldn't, couldn't we do a different... Agora vou pegar a cobra! He said that now he... É melhor do que você, por isso vou pegar com muito cuidado. He said now he's gonna grab the grand finale, it's the snake. The snake? Yeah, sure. Could we do a different scene? I can send stuff of it. Could we do a... Oh, man. They're sliding! Pop and jump! Come on, man! Pop for May you suffer. Pop for that! May you suffer the horror of the pain. No, it's not so bad, but this voice is making me scared. <laughs> We have to take a commercial break. Oh, it's gone, it's gone. We'll be right back after this. All right, welcome back. We are going to be talking about the Cafe in the Jaw trilogy. Ah, baby, the Bob of the Boo. Wait, he's not Italian. Oh, did you hear that crack? Crack in the bottle. Oh, what'd you do? We're celebrating. You, uh, scissor? Hell yeah. You got that scissor? Well, this is cool, man. I was excited. And this is a really good idea. I was stoked to, like I said at the top of the show, to explore kind of different formats and, 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 and ways of uh, going about the topics we choose. And I'm very happy to say that I finally watched the Coffin Joe trilogy. Now, oh, yeah. I don't know how you want to do this. So here's the way I would like to do it. Yeah, uh, well, first, before we start about the movie, I kind of want to just give a little uh, bio summary of Jose Mozica Marines. The man himself. Okay. The Hell man. yeah. He, born, he died recently, but uh, he was born on March 13th, 1936 in San Paulo, Brazil, to a family of simple means. Jose's love of movies began at an early age. He spent a great deal of his time with his family at the local movie house, which his father helped manage. By the time he was 18, he had completed over 80 films. From his earliest years, his interest has always been in horror movies or ones that offer shocking social commentary. When Jose was offered the lead role of Coffin Joe, that's wrong. I don't know why it says he's offered it because he created it and he made the movie. Uh, in Brazil's first, uh, th that's a kind of a milestone. This is Brazil's first ever full length horror movie ever made. Uh, At midnight, I'll take your soul. The character quickly became his trademark. His look included a black top hat, suit, and cape. Initially, he wore long artificial nails but for uh, over 30 years, grew his own uh, nails to grotesque lengths. He finally cut his famous nails in 1998. But yeah, like, uh, this, what, this, he, he was kind of like, uh, like people are going to be like, ew, gross when I say this, but like, he was kind of like uh, Kevin Smith in that he kind of had a, a movie universe going on long before Marvel did, where uh, like he'd have different movies, but Coffin Joe would always kind of show up in there. So just mm -hmm. by default, he was always kind of growing his nails out to just always be like, so just Prepare. in case, like he put him in a new movie and stuff. Yeah, and this in this trilogy is just the movies that are his actual canon, right? The the, the Coffin Joe story. That's the way yeah. I understood it. Yeah. Uh, before uh, there was a, an official trilogy, there was kind of like bootleggers would sell like DVDs of like the Coffin Joe trilogy, and they'd put like a different movie as the third one. And he always said like, "No, it's not. It's not a trilogy." But then the eventually made a uh, kind of a bookend for uh, the series. So it wasn't one of those things where there was always talk about him wanting to do a third one to wrap it up. It, it So that wasn't the case. It just kind of happened. I think so. I could be wrong though. So the way I'd like to do this, if you don't mind, obviously this is your pick. So you kind of host it and you can kind of explain, mm -hmm. set up each movie. And before you actually go into your opinions, I think it's the way you always do it. Let me give you my opinions as the as the novice going in, mm -hmm. <laughs> my first impressions. So you set it up, and I'll give you my opinions. So Cause I because I'm hoping because my hope is I'm not off the mark on some of this stuff because I don't want you to say some of the stuff that I hopefully mm -hmm. am gonna say. But go ahead, go ahead. So I, I'm just gonna mention the character's real name one time because then I'm gonna because they never call him Coffin Joe in the movie. That's just kind of his name's Jose. But uh, his full name is, and I'll say, uh, Josephel Zanatas, a.k.a., because sometimes they call him Z in most of the movies. So, uh, a.k.a. Z du Kaixel, or something like that. I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. But from now on, I'm just going to refer to him as Joe, Coffin Joe. They call him Coffin Joe in the newest one, the third one. 
Yeah. But that's, but that's like, they call pinhead pinhead and yeah, all these exactly. things. Exactly. It's yeah. the same thing. It's like, well, his reputation and his uh, pop culture status precedes him now. We have to call him pinhead because that's mm-hmm. what everybody calls him. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so, do you want to set it up? Do you want to go movie by movie or what? How do you want to do it? Yeah, we and then can kind go of, movie by movie you want. That's kind yeah, of how and I then, made the notes. Okay, cool. So you kick it off and then hopefully just kind of ping it pong back to me because I've got, I took notes. I will tell you this more than any other movie. I had to pay attention to these because they're in fucking subtitles and which yeah. obviously I knew that because I knew it was a Brazilian films and, and, all, and all that stuff, but I, I didn't think about it. It didn't really click with me because, uh, you know, I have a lot of work to do and I got to do a lot of stuff. So I was trying to multitask and I'm like, well, fuck, I forgot subtitles. So I really had to dedicate chunks of time of sitting down and mm-hmm. really like focus, which is good. It was good because it made me really focus. Um. It's kind of funny too, because like as a kid, like it's so it's funny how your your horizons broaden. Because like as a kid, it's like I would never, I I can't even imagine myself watching a black and white movie. And then now it's like, how the fuck could I have ever thought that? And then like, of course, back then, like the idea of watching a foreign movie that I had to read would be like completely out of the question. It's mm. funny. So, at midnight, I'll take your soul. Also known by its porno parody title, at midnight, I'll fuck your hole, which I prefer. <laughs> not really. That's not a real thing, but it could have been. It starts out with our main character, Cat Stevens, just playing. It's not Cat <laughs> Stevens. It's our boy. He's given us his look into, it's a look into his personal uh, philosophy. Life is the beginning of death. Death is the end. The only way to live on is by passing on your bloodline through uh, our children. And like that's basically his whole motto, and he's a uh, basically the entire series. Every movie is basically him trying to find the woman that's gonna bear his child, you know. So, uh, but uh, more in depth. Uh, this one it starts out: Joe is the grave digger at a cemetery in a small town, who finds out one day that the woman he's uh, he's been seeing don't know if they're married or what, but he, he's kind of living with her. Uh, he finds out one day uh, she's unable to bear a child. And since he is, uh, he sees passing on your DNA as the uh, the ultimate goal, uh, he completely loses interest in her, and uh, he starts uh, lusting after his friend Antonio's fiance. He's he's a fucking prick. He doesn't. The friendship means nothing to Coffin Joe. <laughs> uh, so he decides like to murder his old uh, love because you know he doesn't see the point in letting someone who can't reproduce like take up space on the world. And it's one of the most violent scenes I've ever seen shot pre 1970s. Yeah, definitely. This was made in 90 or uh, 1964. 64. Yeah. And so uh, after that, he drowns his buddy Antonio in his bathtub to get him out of the picture because uh, he wants, you know, his fiance all to himself. Uh, when Antonio's fiance refuses Joe, he rapes her and beats her. Uh, in the aftermath, uh, the fiance ends up committing suicide, but not before vowing to get revenge on Joe from beyond the grave. You know, it was Joe mocks because like, he's very, uh, convinced. Atheist. Yeah. He's very <laughs> convinced. There's no afterlife. He's very vocal about it throughout the whole series. He like, he taunts the, the town's folks, like whenever they're doing their religious ceremonies and all this stuff really. Yeah. He's, he's, he's kind of, he's, he's that dickhead on the internet with the fedora. Yeah. He's got a top hat. <laughs> So he's very vocal about that through the whole uh, entire trilogy of films. And so the small town suspects Joe is the killer, which leads to a, a town doctor deciding to do an autopsy uh, on the, I don't, was it Antonio or was it uh, his uh, fiance? I don't remember. I don't remember which of the two it was. I mean, he yeah. killed fucking everybody, but yeah, I don't remember who he did the yeah. autopsy on, but they, you know, maybe Antonio, they, they ruled it an accident. Cause I remember like, it was, it was an accident. Like we can't link him to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so like Joe isn't about that. He's not going to let that happen. So uh, it results in a fiery death of the the doctor trying to do the autopsy. Uh, the story ultimately leads to Joe uh, escorting a new young lady that he's hoping to mate with. To her aunt's house on the day of the dead celebration, uh, which is like a cultural thing uh, where they shot the movie. Uh, and on his way back through the graveyard, uh, his past comes back to haunt him. Mm-hmm. So what did that? That's the overline of the whole movie. We could get into the nitty gritty, kind of more deeper I, stuff. While I would like to get in. I, let me get to the nitty gritty. I took a lot of notes. These are very fresh in mind. I watched all these movies 
back to back to back. Well, over the course of three days, I watched one per day for the most part. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, should I, as I go, can I kind of tell you how I feel about the movies or would you rather me save that like for the end end? Whichever you want. I, I think what I'll say is the first movie I think is the most pure of, mm-hmm. of the three, right? Um, so I might be inclined to say, I think it's the, my favorite of them, but, but we'll get there. I mean, but I think it's the most pure, I think it's antiquated by today's standards, obviously, but way ahead of his time, like mm-hmm. 1964, you know, some of the gore, like when he takes that broken beer bottle and fucking cuts that guy's fingers off and stabs mm-hmm. his hand, like sh- in the rape scene, you know, I get it. You could say, well, it's been done way more harsher, but this is 1964. This predates fucking dawn a night of the living dead. And mm-hmm. it goes harder than night of the living dead. Um, that that scene where he kills her, he's like he's he's beating her like like uh, like one thing I really like about the movie is the opening, like all three of them, because there's like three openings to the movie. It starts uh-huh. out with him kind of you know uh, talking to the camera. Giving you got the witch. Phone. You got the witch doing it. You got him doing it. Yeah, that, that that's like a little uh, kind of horror host kind of thing it has going for it too, which mm-hmm. is cool. And that like that weird scream she does after she introduces the movie always creeped yeah. me out. <laughs> And it has got those old school like uh, title sequences, wherever that you could tell they had to like film it again with like the titles over, like and animate the titles over the movie. So it's got um, a charm that really works for it because of where it came from and when it mm-hmm. came from, right? It's kind of got that macabre kind of cartoony, you know, Scooby Doo kind of thing going for it. But that was mm-hmm. that Adams Family kind of aesthetic, right? The monster, but that's. Yeah. That's what was horror back then, the macabre, right? That we didn't have, we didn't have fucking Hellraiser, we didn't have uh, this shit that came out, but it was a real trailblazing thing. Um, I mean, now you look at someone like Coffin Joe, he kind of looks like somebody dressing up for Halloween. Like, really, this guy walked. If you think about it in that context, a guy that walks around with a top hat and these fingernails, it almost seems so cliche and silly, just something they would spook. But when it was done so long ago, it was it it wasn't cliche. Mm-hmm. It just kind of was laying the foundation. See, I, I like to think this is what Cat was doing in his off time before he became Yusuf. Yeah, <laughs> I think uh, I think it's interesting that um, the film focuses on the antagonist. You know, we're driven by his perspective. I don't know how much that had been done up to that point. I know it's been done before, um, but uh, yeah, 1964. I don't know because you know it's not like Freddy Krueger, right? Because I know some people are like, yeah, he's kind of the Brazilian boogeyman or Brazilian Freddy Krueger. Freddy mm-hmm. Krueger, he's not the focal. Mm-hmm. Right. The, it's it's whoever the, the 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 final girl is or whatever. And the kids he's taunting. Uh, Joe is like the fucking main guy and the antagonist. You know what I mean? It's like it's mm-hmm. his fucking vehicle, which is interesting, um, which is kind of weird because I don't know. I, I think normal movie rules. It's like who are you rooting for <laughs> when when Joe's like the main character and the bad guy? Like, are we rooting for the bad guy and all these people he's killed? It's kind of odd. But um. You know, and it's it, it kind of plays out. And some of these things I'm going to say about this movie, keep in mind, I was taking my notes as I watched each movie. So as I got further into the series here, I, I came to realize some of these things I might say are going to be a running theme for maybe mm-hmm. all of them. Yeah. But, you know, especially this one, when I got done watching it and uh, it had a it's like a Christmas carol without the redemption and remorse at the end. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know the ghosts are haunting him and stuff like that but like unlike ebenezer scrooge he doesn't have that redemption he's just still a denier and all that shit uh like i said then of course i watched the second one and the third one and realized wow they really beat this dead don't they like yeah <laughs> it's the same same thing but uh <laughs> but it's the same anyway uh there's a couple little fun notes i wanted to to, to add to bring to your attention like who were those fucking casket padlocks at the end meant to keep out? Because my fucking man karate chopped them with like a wet noodle. <laughs> my man fucking kar- my man karate chopped them off with his bare hand like a wet noodle man, and they just like, <laughs> they just came off. Like were like, they supposed to <laughs> just flick them off? It was so ridiculous. I'm They're like, just well, there to like you know because you're, they don't ex- suspect somebody's gonna want to open it, so they don't really need to put real log. That costs money. But I like, yeah. It's just like he literally did like a Bruce Lee move and it just, yeah. And it was like the littlest padlock ever. I'm like, okay, so clearly these weren't designed to keep out grave robbers and fucking necrophiliacs. <laughs> Were they designed to keep the fucking corpses out? I don't, I don't get it. But, mm-hmm. uh, oh, and I want to say too, that final shot's really cool. And I think that should be a cinema anima shirt where his head's upside down when his eyes are like yeah. bulbous. 
I can, I can, I can go ahead and uh, spoiler alert tell the ending, you know, like just in case yeah, you yeah, wanted yeah. to watch it with us and didn't want us to. So yeah, at the end, like he's going through the cemetery, and then like yeah, all the people from his pal, the dead uh, ghosts and everything they see. It's, it's kind of a like they they threw in a bunch of like unneeded special effects, like uh, the first guy. He's got like a weird, uh, I, I can't tell what they were trying to do. It looked like maybe like some ghostly aura around him, but it looks like they just kind of drew over the film negative. Mm-hmm. And so like, yeah, it, it's kind of cheesy to today's standards, but like, yeah, he basically, it, it, so the, the whole thing with the movie is, is basically a revenge movie with, uh, you know, supernatural, uh, you know, tones in there at the end. And then, yeah, like it, it ends with him going in. He's getting chased by like basically these ghosts, and he ends up in the like this little cathedral like area where uh, the the fiance and and Antonio are buried. I can't remember the fiance. It's day, it's day of the dead, right? So the dead rise and all that. Yeah, stuff. and yeah. Uh, like he he looks in there to make sure they're still in there. He ends up freaking out, and then like the townsfolk kind of come in and find him, and he's like, it looks like he's dead. He probably was supposed to be dead at the, the end of the first movie, but then like the sequel they. Yeah, put him back. He's like hanging upside down. He's got like his eye like bulging out of his skull and stuff. But hopefully if Zach is down for it, by the time you're hearing this, we have that on the fucking Teespring. Like that mm-hmm. should be one of the cinema anime like designs that we do with the fucking because <laughs> it was just very iconic looking. Uh, are you going to actually bring up uh, the the meaning of the name? Like because it actually plays some relevance, right? To the whole I, at midnight, I'll take your soul because it was like pertaining yeah. to how they bury him. Yeah, go ahead. The, the the creepy horror host at the beginning also serves as like a, a fortune teller. At one point in the movie, him and Antonio and the fiance, I, th- I think it was all of them. It might have been uh, before or after Antonio died, but they went there and like she basically looked over at Antonio and said like, oh, your your life's going to end soon or something like that. So more poetic and creepy sounding than I just pointed it out as. But then like, yeah, fucking... She looks at Joe and she's just like calls him evil and stuff. And like, yeah, like she periodically throughout the movie, she shows up and like reminds him that like his, his it, ending isn't going to be happy pretty much. Uh, well, wasn't there also some relevance of, of, of when they were doing the procession and the burial and stuff like at midnight, like it saves your soul or something like that. And you don't come back. Wasn't there like some fucking bullshit lore about that? There might have been. I might have missed it. It was something like that. Um, but anyway, so the, the the woman he kills, the superior being, the the woman worthy of carrying his seed, she has this whole thing where she's like, I will get revenge on you. I will haunt you. Right. She mm-hmm. does that whole fucking thing. She does that fucking Bob Marley thing, um, which if you want, can I actually break tradition a little bit? And can I start off the second movie if you're ready to move on to it? <laughs> uh, I got a couple more things I can say. Real quick. Oh, on the first. OK, go for it. Go for it. Um. Okay, that might be it. Never mind. Because <laughs> we talk. All right, so I, I'm gonna kind of. I wanna. I wanna basically tell you my cliff notes of the first one, second one, and then you can fill in the gaps. But mm-hmm. uh, basically, let's go into uh, Coffin Joe Two. Still wants to be a daddy. That's what I call it. All right. So here's the notes I took. He beats a dead horse with his monologues on atheism. Like you think death is the end. We get it. His little rants and mine gone forever. It's like every two seconds, he's like, la, 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 death is not there. You are all sheep. It's like he goes on and on. Like, I get it. Like, we've, I feel like Ghostbusters 2, who I've heard all of this, Janos. Because mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like, and um, it makes him come off a little hokey because it's like, oh my God, this guy is sniffing his own farts. But uh, yeah, it's just kind of the same thing over and over again. Uh, yeah, and I, I was going to mention that like he, he talks about how like uh, he does horror movies and like these movies with, you know, political uh, undertones, basically like the whole like uh, inferior man. And so it was, he's definitely like talking about things that were going on at the time. And, yeah, like, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my other cliff notes, I'll just keep going down the line here. Uh <laughs> Bit of a retread, I put. It's definitely sequelitis. Uh, he has the same motives of impregnating a worthy woman of his seed. Uh, he kills a woman who swears vengeance in her afterlife. Same thing, right? Same mm-hmm. fucking thing. Uh, but she shows her titty, though, in that scene. It's cool. Yeah, there's this movie has boobies. Yeah, and I'm going to get to that, too. I'm going to get to that. Uh, during the sex scene between Coffin Joe and his superior woman, who's just as fucked up as he is, uh, <laughs> the close-up kiss reveals that she has a really gross mustache going on. <laughs> I didn't know that was very distracting. Like even in a black and white lo-fi looking movie, like she had a fucking mustache, like the great Zora and the fall. Oh, it was really weird. Uh, and he says, he's definitely, <laughs> I find it ironic 
that a murderous antagonist is pro-life. He's so anti-abortion that, you know what I mean? Like, that's his whole fucking mantra in this. Uh, he goes, uh, oh, I think it's really cool, though. In the fact that it's a sequel, it is sequelitis. It's basically retreading the same shit, but it does all the same stuff bigger, right? It's mm-hmm. got a bigger body count, more gore, uh, like Zach kind of alluded to. It's got nudity. It's got quite a bit of titty shots in this, actually. And then even the... Uh, it's got a lot more trippier sequences with the whole Technicolor hell, which is really cool. Yeah, there's a scene out of nowhere where like uh, the whole movie's black and white, but like he goes to hell, and that's the one scene that's in color. It's a like dream sequence. That was their budget right there, mm-hmm. you know, because it was probably really expensive or something at the time. But uh, you know, and I actually want to ask you during that whole like hell scene, how in 1967, because that's when the second one came out here. Which, by the way, what's it really called? I called it Coffee Joe Two. I still want to be a daddy. It's called This Night I'll Possess Your Corpse. Okay, This Night I'll Possess Your That's a better title. But uh, how did they pull off that double effect when he was standing right next to the devil, a.k.a. his twin, right? Yeah, like he sees the devil, and it's basically him on a throne surrounded by chicks. And yeah, I don't know. There was one one frame where they were next to each other. And I have to say, it looked a lot better than the doubling shit they did in the 80s and early 90s, right? Mm-hmm. And I don't know if the the black and white and the, the graininess of the film kind of helped like hide the fucking warts and everything of that, but it looked pretty good. Oh, it wasn't black and white. It was color. That's yeah, right. Was color yeah. I don't know. It looked pretty good though. Um, I think, uh, being an older movie, you definitely have to, I had to suspend my disbelief a lot more when it came to like the torture scenes, right? Like they were driving spikes into heads and pitchforks into crawling bodies, but they were just getting poked. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Like it, like you, I really had to like, okay, I get it. This is a really old movie. They're just barely poking him with these Halloween props. All the demons were dudes with like speedos on painted red. Yeah. Uh, but they had a lot of titties in there, man. I'm saying, I'm probably some dicks too, but, but they had a lot of titties, man. I was like, really? Sh- See, man. I don't know if the, you, if you were supposed to notice that they're wearing speedos or like they're painted at the same color as the speedo to imply like, Oh, they're like androgynous. They just got like a, a fucking lump there. Like the guys. And I think, uh, like I said, in true sequel, I just form making this movie just more the same, but bigger. They really drove home. Like I said, like his messages, like he was on way more podiums in this movie, really driving that message home of, I get it. God's not real. The only truth is blood. The only thing that's real is life. You are a Supreme being all this great. I mean, it, it, a lot of times it felt like, all right, this is getting a little heavy handed, but at the same time, it kind of adds to, his character because he obviously suffers from fucking delusions of grandeur hardcore mm. and i and so maybe it's almost intentional or i can give it a pass because he's this over the top guy because at the end of the day he's just a fucking lunatic mm-hmm. you know he's just a he doesn't worship the devil he's at it's actually odd he's like no i just don't believe in anything i believe in myself i'm gonna dress i'm gonna dress like fucking alistair crowley and look like the fucking devil himself but i don't believe in that halloweeny shit that's that's stupid that's icky um there's multiple uh, people throughout the series that refer to him as the devil, though. When they might, like, yeah, that's definitely what he's implying. Yeah, like when he goes to hell and sees himself. Yeah, uh, I mean, there's subtext there, I guess. All of a sudden, in this one, he has an Igor guy named Bruno. I don't think he was in the first one. He just kind of shows up. And it's Master. not the cool Bruno that, like, with the fucking cool haircut from uh, Bruno. You know, yeah, exactly. It's not the <laughs> Sasha Baron Cohen guy. But but basically, uh, my only thing is, I think this movie is literally the same. <laughs> they just go bigger yeah. and it's the longest in the series. Yeah, I, can, I can see that. See, to me, like this, uh, to me, this movie kind of took the place of the first one when I first saw it because it's like, oh, it's like the first one, but they added all these exploitation film type of things in here. This is great. I, I think they're, they're basically tit for tat. I don't really like one or the other more than the other. I think they're both, they're both. Oh, that's up. what I came down with this time watching them. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I gave them both the same score. We'll, we'll go over scores and stuff after, but, yeah, like I, I, I give the first one props because it's the most pure and it's the first. Uh, mm-hmm. And like I said, I gave this one equal props because if it's going to do the same thing, at least it went hard. Um, yeah. And that that fucking that that Technicolor hell was really cool. That was a cherry on top because it was you didn't see it coming. And it was the longest one. The first one's like what? Like 85 minutes. Yeah. Even the third one's like not even 90 minutes. I don't think this one was like an hour and 48 minutes. And mm-hmm. it, so it had like an extra 20 minutes on it. And, uh, but it never felt slow. It never felt, um, it just had a lot more visual shit going on for it. But, um, yeah, 
Anyway, now if so, you want to break down the movie. Yeah, I, I can. Uh, so, like, it's funny because he kind of retcons the ending of the last movie to make this one still go on. Like, he's still the same character. Oh, you mean he doesn't do that in the third one, too? Okay, continue. Yes. Yeah, so, so, at the end of the first movie, you think, like, oh, he should definitely know that, like, there's an afterlife now. But, like, nope, he doesn't. <laughs> so, like, so Joe, uh, at the beginning of this movie, Joe survives the events from the first film. He's patched back up good as new from the doctors. Really good. Really good. He was <laughs> fucked it, up in that first one, dude. His eyes yeah. were like almost out of his skull. He's eventually absolved from all the crimes because of lack of evidence, quote unquote. So he uh, he heads to a new small town to fulfill his uh, ultimate goal of finding the perfect woman to give uh, birth to, as he says, uh, the superior man. By the way, I, I was I was wondering what was going to happen. I thought maybe they were going to go the route of, well, he impregnates somebody finally in the series, but she has a girl because he just assumes. <laughs> they might have uh, that weird. Uh, we'll get to that. I'll, I'll bring that up when I okay, get. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. But I know what you're saying, though. The the yeah the social commentary. Yeah, but. he's got a new Igor like character helping him out. His boy Bruno. He has a hunchback and a a scarred up face, and his lip juds out like he's uh, stuffing a whole can's worth of that. You remember that ground up beef jerky back in the day? We yeah. we get and get like to feel like we were grown ups. Yeah, <laughs> that, that shit was dank. So Bruno, he helps Joe kidnap six women from the village to uh, perform an experiment to see which one of them is worthy of uh, taking his Omega load. It's all <laughs> for nothing, though, because the one that passes ultimately is deemed unfit after sh- she shows like empathy for uh, the because uh, he takes the ones that lost and puts them to death. And he basically wants to mate with her while they're watching them die. And she shows some empathy. So he's like, ah, oh, fuck it. You're not good enough for my load after, after all. But you're missing one part. Uh, is Bruno is basically his roadie because it was his birthday. And he's like, you can have your pick. Which one do you like? And then he takes <laughs> yeah. her and he fucks her. And then he comes back like almost like the guy from Green Mile. I, I killed her, boss. I didn't mean to. I had my hands right her now. I killed her, boss. He accidentally broke her neck because <laughs> he <laughs> don't know his own strength. <laughs> so now Joe is setting his sights on Laura, the daughter of the powerful colonel uh, of the town. Hey, Laura, Laura, yeah. Laura. When he kept saying her name, yeah. For, for her to be the bearer of his child. Uh, and Laura's father, the colonel, finds out and uh, assembles a gang of criminals to take out Joe and end his evil once and for all. That's uh, That's the outline. But then, like, at the end... Basically, uh, spoiler alert, if you wanted to watch the movie first, but like it comes, we find out that like uh, there's a doctor there getting ready to give birth and the doctor basically tells her like, uh, you know, uh, you're going to die if uh, you give birth. And she says, fuck it, like uh, my my kid should must live. And of course, Joe's like, yeah, fuck it, of course, like the kid must live. But then, you know, she uh, she dies before she gives birth. So he's back at square one, baby. (laughs) That's okay though, because that means we get to have a part three, or it's the exactly. same shit. Um, <laughs> now, do you want to talk about the ending, or do you want to go into the third one? Or we could talk. Like I wrote down like three or four bullet points. Like uh, the the experiment that he put the uh, women that he kidnapped through was basically like he uh, put them in a room while they were sleeping. He released a bunch of like big ass tarantulas. Mm-hmm. And that, like, they're the one that like shows some promise. Like, she's not freaking out. Like, it's showing the tarantula crawling in between her tits, and, stuff. <laughs> and she's completely like, she's completely like okay with that. And then, yeah, he lets Bruno pick one. And then, uh, <laughs> I killed it, boss. I'm doing that Michael Clark Duncan voice. Like, I just smashed it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so stupid. He's a. Uh, at least he's the uh, hospitable and charitable, like rapist. Like he he gives, you know. He doesn't always take. Mm -hmm. He's very nice to Bruno. And then while he's trying to mate with the one that wins, like uh, she's not worthy because she shows empathy. That's actually whenever the the chick in the that's they put them to death, basically, by putting them in like a little dungeon and releasing some snakes in there. So, yeah, while uh, the last one's dying, she uh, uh, much like the first movie, she uh, condemns him to, uh, you know, haunt him in the afterlife. I'll get my revenge in the afterlife. Which, by the way, when he was uh, in bed with her while her friends or whatever were getting tortured by, those, quote unquote, tortured by those snakes. One of those other moments where you have to sort of suspend disbelief because, like, we're supposed to believe that they're getting mutilated down there. And they're just, like, holding these snakes. Like, ah! 
<laughs> they're not really yeah, doing anything. You, you could tell the snake's not really like choking her or anything. None of it, yeah. But yeah, he ends up finding out that that last one that condemned him uh, was uh, pregnant, and then he gets real bummed out because he killed a, a baby. Like he's got some things he's emotional about. He's not well, completely. That's, that's yeah, the irony that he's pro life, and because uh, exactly. you know children are are precious. Children are are the ultimate. You know, like I, yeah, he will not kill a kid. Because at the start of this movie, a guy almost runs over a kid on a motorbike, right? Mm -hmm. And they kind of set that whole precedent, that tone of his, you know, his uh, feelings towards children. Yeah, they're pointing out, like, this, the dichotomy between, yeah, so, like, so, uh, I wrote down, how lucky is he to have found Laura? Like, this chick is just like, oh, yeah, this goth fucking Abraham Lincoln that doesn't trim his nails, he's so hot. Like, that was lucky. I, we all got somebody for us. I never have seen or heard of another guy that has this fucking much trouble fathering a child. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah, he kind of drops all the standards in the third one and just kind of impregnates a bunch of women. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 But it's just like, he, I guess he was just too picky, but man, I, I got tons of people that'll give you their kid that had a million by accident. Mm -hmm. But I'm just saying like some exactly. people, like this guy, maybe he's like, can't produce. I don't know. Yeah, but it made me think like, uh, well, I, I guess I'll get to that when I get to. I, I think they should have made movie. the sequel more like a comedy, like Big Daddy, where he adopts a Hell kid. Oh yes, you know, and he's teaching him how to pee on the side of buildings and stuff, and you mm -hmm. know, trip rollerbladers with uh, sticks. The last bullet point I got was the killing of Laura's brother, because whenever uh, yeah. her family finds out, like uh, her, her brother tries to go kill him, and uh, there's a cool scene where like. Uh, he, uh, like he kills a rat like with two there's like a, a little mechanism with a rock that he puts a rat on and then it lowers another rock and smashes a rock, like the rat uh, i don't know if they killed a real rat or if that was fake no because you can you can clearly see like it does a cut obviously right when it smashes mm -hmm. onto a prop and but before it does the cut you can the, the angle is not real well you can see the rock is hollow Oh, okay. <laughs> like yeah. underneath it, like they didn't really pull off that angle very well, and you see like a hollow box, like rot go over the rat. Then it cuts to a like a grape. Yeah, I didn't notice. Okay, yeah. And then they they smash his head, and he, he mocks him and taunts him again. He's like, "Oh yeah, yeah, yeah there's no God. He's not going to help you." Uh, like uh, he catches the top of the the rope holding the top rock up, and he's like, "Oh, if you got if there's a God, he'll he'll, he'll extinguish that for you." <laughs> and then like uh he walks all it smashes his head and then later on we see the aftermath of his smashed head and it's pretty gnarly looking. Yeah. Um so we could talk about the end of this movie kind of, but it kind of goes into the third movie, right? Cuz they kind of like uh do the Jason recap. Yeah, so at the very end of this movie, he basically he has a come to uh like moment where he he's uh, asking for a sign and like uh he he sees like basically the townspeople chase him into like uh like a Frankenstein, kinda, they have a lynch mob going like a Frankenstein mm -hmm. monster and they got the priests and the clergy and all that shit. And the thing I don't understand it once again, they they finished this movie off like it was ending. And then they had to rewrite some shit in the third one to justify it. So mm -hmm. this is the way I understood it. Maybe I'm a little confused. So they cornered him where they were at or whatever. And he's in the swamp and he starts drowning or whatever. He's denying everything. But as soon as like he starts having his visions and I don't know if bodies were pulling him down or whatever, but he starts seeing all those skeletons come up and he's drowning. Was that him? You couldn't see his face, but was that supposed to be him talking, like actually repenting? Like I'm pretty sure it was. Yeah. yeah. Please, Father. Please, please. I believe. he was repenting in his time of you know desperation, and because he was believing, and he dies, or does he? They pull him underneath, or before that though, he was like he was you know yelling out after a soon to be uh, you know mate like died and took the kid with her. Uh, he was outside. and He was like. You know, uh, show me a sign, and it's like taunting. And then, like, uh, some uh, lightning strikes the trees next to, him and it falls on him. He's like, "That's not, that's not, not good, not enough. good enough." <laughs> <laughs> He's like, "I still don't believe." And that and that could easily him. be interpreted as like, you know, a skeptic's never going to believe. It doesn't matter what you fucking show him. Exactly. But yeah, and then after he's pulled down underwater, it has like a little quote at the end. I forgot what it was, but yeah, like it was. I I actually quite like the ending. I, I, I like the ending. I even like the proposed ending of this one where he was repenting. And because and, I mean, is that not real life? Like you have all these people that I, I bet you I bet you start 
acting differently in the last moments of their life, right? About how mm-hmm. they view that stuff. When when you start looking mortality right in the face, it's like in the Simpsons movie where, you know, uh, the end of the world's coming, you know, and they think uh, the whole world's going to, you know, come to an end or whatever. And they have, uh, they position the church right next to Moe's Tavern. <laughs> and then when like, I think it's the dome or whatever's like looming over them and everybody's freaking out like it's the apocalypse. Everybody out of the church starts running into Moe's bar and everybody out of Moe's bar runs into the church. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's actually a pretty clever joke. Cause it's like, you know, <laughs> that's kind of maybe how it would go down, but yeah, I mean, it makes total sense that someone like Joe, uh, in his final moments of desperation, he would realize his mortality like everybody else. And he would realize that his fucking hype is bullshit and he would start pleading to God. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I like the way it ended. Which yeah. we could go into whenever you're done talking about this one, which will take us right into the third one. I I was going to read some. Uh, there, none of these movies have trivia except for the, the first one. And there's some cool ones I was, I was going to say real quick. Uh, oh the, there was a scene in the first movie where the crew refused to shoot uh, a scene because there wasn't enough sunlight. Director Jose Mojica Marines uh, forced them to shoot the scene by pointing a gun at the cameraman. Uh, various crew members have confirmed the story uh, on one of the rare occasions when he would uh, respond to questions about the incident. Marines uh, claims that the gun was only a prop. So, yeah, he might have been like kind of an eccentric guy. Like, uh, mm-hmm. you know, I got to get my shot. Uh, uh, you know what you want, be damned. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, here's another one. Jose. Psychopathy breeds genius. Exactly. Uh, creative. Yeah. Jose uh, sold his house and car to finance the, the movie, the first one. Uh, director Jose, uh, he played the main role when the original actor quit. He put on the best uh, black suit he could find and added a top hat. He had long thumbnails at the time, but added artificial fingernails for the rest of his fingers. Was and, he a uh, classical guitar player with that thumbnail? Possibly, yeah. This film was released at a time when Brazil had disbanded their national censorship board. This film was banned outright in some states and shown to great success in others. Some of the censorship committees were less uh, concerned with the portrayal of violence than they were with uh, what they regarded as blasphemy. And uh, this one, kind of, I already mentioned this, but although the name was not used in the English language subtitles, the character of Z Do. Cake CO uh, became known in English as Coffin Joe. Yeah. So that's all of them I got. Well, which is a good good way to transition into the third one. Can I do the, the same way and just kind of give you my bullet points and then you can kind of go over the... If you want. Yeah. yeah, I'd like to do that. Okay. So now moving on to Coffin Joe 3, So Very Tired, because uh, that's what it's... That's what it's here, I'm just going to read my bullet points as I fucking typed them. Uh, didn't he die in the last one? Did they film a new ending continuation in black and white <laughs> with lookalike actors, or was that yeah. deleted? Or was that a deleted scene? Because it looked like the old Coffin Joe. It was. It was well done. Yeah, because it, it really looked like the actor. But I mean, like it really fooled me. But uh, but I, I literally had to like rub my eyes. Like I, I was paying good attention. If I did, did they show this? Like no, he died, mm-hmm. and I was. Yeah, it ends with him going the cross, the cross. Yeah, and in this one, he's like, it's not the cross. <laughs> it's yeah. like I would have noticed. That. Okay, yeah, they they totally rewrote everything. Of course, uh, another bullet point: Why haven't his nails grown longer in forty years? Because <laughs> they're like the same length. Uh, and also, when he gets out of prison, why is his house and torture dungeon still there? <laughs> like, why didn't they seize this shit? Because he just comes home to Igor, like, oh, thanks for waiting me, uh, fucking Bruno. Like, oh, mm-hmm. just as I left it, pulling blankets off all this old fucking torture shit in his little dungeon. Uh, mm-hmm. And also, I got to note, the scene transitions are really fucking silly. I fucking hate them with a passion. Uh, I might not have noticed. Yeah. All the scenes transition with this, like, weird side to side effect. It makes it look like an episode of yeah, Mario for the Dark. Those side swipes or the side wipe or whatever they're called. Yeah. I, like I, I feel like. All it's missing is the Bulk and Skull theme. And then it transitions to a Power Ranger. Like, well, because that's how Power Rangers and shit does. Like, these stupid mm-hmm. TV shows. And it's just got a very, it's got full moon vibes. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Uh, it's funny because uh, fucking 20th Century Fox put this movie out. Which was weird. I was blown away when I saw that. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, maybe, maybe 
was that an American distribution thing or were they just kind of doing it in Brazil? Because it, it probably is bigger in Brazil, right? Just because of the, it, it, was, it was probably just for America version. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it, basically Coffin Joe gets out of prison and guess what? He wants to be a dad still, but now he's <laughs> fucking old and he's probably shooting fucking sawdust out of his cock. Uh, <laughs> but he still wants to be a dad. And this time he's got his own Brazilian Manson family that I guess mm-hmm. have just uh, gotten together and started worshiping this guy ever since he's been in prison for 40 fucking years. Um, mm-hmm. My, 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 my stance on it before you get into it is it's overall got a really hokey cartoony vibe to it. Uh, but that worked in the sixties because the movies were ahead of the times, like we already said, but it's got that same fucking vibe in 2008. The same approach comes off cheap and corny <laughs> and mm-hmm. it, it's very tame. It doesn't, it doesn't work the same. Like, I think if you're, I, I feel like they were up against the odds anyway, continuing off those movies 40 years later. Like I, Mm -hmm. I, part of me felt after I watched that, which by the way, this one was a little hard for me to get through, by the way, it wasn't, it wasn't a very easy movie to get through. Uh, This is the least best one by far. And I felt like, man, had I been a coffin Joe fan for 40 years and they announced this sequel, this, this, this bookend to the trilogy. And I, this is what I got. I can imagine being very disappointed, but I was also thinking, Hopefully, if I was this Coffin Joe fan for years and years and years and years, and they finally released a sequel after so long, I my realistic expectations would hopefully be in place, right? Because mm. I, I wouldn't. But I just, I don't know, man. It's just, uh, it just doesn't work. I feel like if they were going to do this, they had to, I hate the term modernize, but they had to do something because they're just trying to do the same shit. And it just comes off like a parody of Adam's family shit. It, it's like, it's like you're parodying. Th- these movies in the sixties, which comes off hokey, right? It's not the sixties anymore, which I get it. It, it was is a continuation of movies that were in the sixties. Mm-hmm. Um, I just don't think it really works. He's walking around like a movie of the week host. Now it looks even sillier. It always looks silly, but like I said, you watch it with the sixties backdrop. And like I said, that kind of macabre thing that was ahead of its time for the day. It, it's all part of the period. And it adds to the charm. You watch this motherfucking old man with a top hat and weird fucking fingernails. And I'm like, this is corny, man. It comes off as a uh, cosplay. Cause uh, yeah. one thing I thought, like they should have shot the movie in black and white. Because if you have like a low budget and you can't hire like really good lighting guys and stuff to make it look more professional, it looks cheap. Just shoot it in black and white because the it, uh, it kind of makes it a lot easier to not have to worry about color correcting and all that shit. Yeah, and and I'm probably and I'm sure that's why some of the stuff looked uh, pretty seamless in the old movies because of how black and white and grainy it looked. This one, I I'm not like a guy about effects. I don't really know what I'm talking about with effects, but I could tell this had a lot of fucking effects, like weird green screen shit and. Uh, just mm-hmm. this ugly stuff. And like I said, those weird Microsoft movie maker fucking transitions. <laughs> they were fucking terrible. I don't know why I didn't notice them. They're cringe. And like I said, it, it made me feel like I was watching an episode of the Power Rangers or something. It felt like a a, a family channel movie. Remember ABC Family? Mm-hmm. Remember uh, that Adam's Family sequel that was direct to ABC Family and they recast with Daryl Hannah as the mom and Tim Curry as Gomez Adams? And it just had this... It has this cheap made for TV family channel five. I completely forgot about that. Yeah. yeah. Or it, but it looks like full moon, but everything about it is just amateur. And I'm like, man, I, I just think it didn't do anything for the legacy. I, I think they should just left it fucking alone at the second one. And uh, cause all it did was kind of hurt it to me, honestly. Cause for me, I watched them all at the same time. So I already had a taste on my mouth from the first two. And now this is the last one I watched, you know, when I watched them all close together, I'm like, ugh, and mm-hmm. I mean, plus, yeah, like you, you, like a lot of people, like that's one thing about doing a series is like most people aren't watching them back to back to back. That makes it a lot easier to get tired of something, yeah. you know? True. Yeah. Cause it was the same fucking mantra the whole time. This is no different. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can go ahead and talk about the store if you want. The only difference is it's fucking the expendables. It's an old man version of him. He's 40 years later and he's now got a fucking Manson family group of followers. And like you said, he's going to get a whole bunch of women and fuck them all and see which one, which one takes, <laughs> you know, and Bruno's there. Bruno's fucking old. They got the same actor, which is kind of cool. I guess we got this weird fucking art. Was it the same guy? It looked like Bruno looked the same. It he looked I, a little different to me. Well, he's fucking older, yeah. but I, to me, I watched them all back to back. So it looked like the same guy just much older to me. It looked mm-hmm. like him, but 
Anyway, I might be wrong. Let me know. But it looked like him to me. Uh, this time we got a young priest that comes out of fucking nowhere in the middle of the movie that's seeking revenge for his murdered father in the previous movie. Uh, I like uh, like they put some uh, exposition dialogue there. Mm. Whenever he's uh, introduced to the he's for no reason. He's just telling uh, the guy below him like his lesser officer, like, yeah, I'm really religious. Uh, I, I really like St. Peter. It's like, oh, yeah, he <laughs> told me this. <laughs> yeah, it's really fucking weird. Like, you, you, it's important for you to know. <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> I, uh, it's like the whole Wayne's World thing. Huh. I can't help but think that this is going to play an important role later. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, or whatever he says. I mean, I'll give it one props of kudos here. The rat rape scene. I can't say I've seen that done before. I mean, yeah, it came off hokey, but like the way it looked, it still looked like a goops, goosebumps episode. <laughs> On Fox. Yeah, most most of like the second act of the movie is basically like let's torture a bunch of people. So that scene specifically, they they pour some hot fucking shit on a chick's like stomach and then let a rat go up into her snatch. And we see like a, <laughs> you, you uh, get that uh, what's it that Tiddly Winks? What's that guy on South Park? You get that angle where it's going through from the- inside. <laughs> can see see it come in. Yeah. Uh. So that that's probably the highlight, just because oh well, they did something I I can't say I I've seen much of. Uh. But yeah, man, the movie is just, it wasn't good. Uh, and yeah, it, just, it looked like a full moon mixed with a Goosebumps fucking episode, GB7, Y7, uh, with some violence out of nowhere sometimes. I don't know. It was just really off-putting. I didn't like it. And once again, it was more of the same. And I'm like, this doesn't work 40 years later. I, I didn't even, I didn't have time to actually review it on Letterboxd or see what anybody else think of it, thought of it. I have a mm-hmm. feeling I'm not the only one. I don't, is there people that like this movie? Um... I didn't hate it as much as I remember hating it. Uh, like you did a pretty good job at like summing up the plot. I'll just add like uh, he's got <laughs> <It's> not much. <laughs> he's got a he's got a literal cult following now. Get it? Because the one thing I noticed was kind of the meta things he dropped. Like oh, like the cult is kind of like hinting like oh yeah, now I have these movies and people come to like them. And and then uh, again with the ending, uh, I'll, I'll get to that. So they all follow uh, his philosophy and uh, they're willing to die for him and. Uh, now they're here to help Joe find the his potential mate. But what is the philosophy that atheism? Atheism? That's that's it. Like, why is it? Why are they acting like uh, you know, the son of it, God? Or they, wh- it's it seems to just be implying that whatever like his son's gonna be like something that does something important. <sighs> it's it's not super important, <laughs> important basically as a plot point. But then, like, so some of the bullet points I wrote down to mention, like, uh, there's basically another uh, colonel character in this one. Like, he's the Catholic guy, and uh, he's got kind of a, like, something's going on in the town he's, you know, in charge of, where, like, at night, like, some, some like, uh, authority figures come, and, like, they're shooting people. Like, there's a scene where they're trying to shoot, like, two kids, and Joe comes and, like, stops them long enough for them he's, to get away. He kind of kind of slits his neck, but not all the way. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Uh, the 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 monk guy who we find out is the son of the doctor from the first movie. Mm-hmm. We meet him and he's like, uh, he's got nip- nipple clamps. And yeah, he's like shocking himself. What the fuck? So I guess he's just repressing uh, he, his sexuality because like I can't. Yeah, it, it it seems to be implying that he became a monk just so that he has some kind of authority to like kill, banish, uh. To place to Joe. place a curse on him before he dies, so he can. Yeah, I didn't know monks had this power. Even though in the other two movies, it was just random people that <laughs> kind of did the same. Yeah, thing. but like I didn't know monks had this power. He's making that pact with the colonel or whatever. Like you mm-hmm. can have his body, and I, I am a man of God. I am a, I am a powerful monk, and I will be able to condemn and curse his soul before he dies. Like you can do that. Mm-hmm. I didn't realize you could do that. You're just a monk, bro. Yeah, there, there's a scene where Bruno uh, he sees on TV that there's this doctor. Who's like has his ideology or whatever? Yeah, she she kind of spouts like things similar to what he thinks. So he's like, "Oh, this could be your mate." So the uh, they get her, and like when she meets him and sees him, she's like, "Oh, the famous Coffin Joe, you exist. I'm ready to bear your child and stuff like that." And he has to he he like shoots her with some kind of syringe in the ass. Yeah, and then he like. I don't know if he really like because he cuts. Then he, ew, yeah, he flays that ass meat off her. Yeah, he cuts <laughs> like her butt cheek off and then feeds it to her. But it's possible that she was tripping from whatever he shot into her because, yeah. like, once she kind of comes out of it, you don't really see if it really happened. Yeah, but yeah, that would suck because, like, from now on, she's never going to be able to sit in a chair and be level again. It's always going to like veer to one side. Yeah, 
And, you know. That would suck. Yeah, that would suck. It'd be a Hank Hill thing. He'd have to get like a prosthetic ass, you know, to sit on. Mm -hmm. Well, I feel that, I yeah, I mean, my opinion is the movie didn't add anything to the legacy. I thought it was kind of, sh it felt like, um, what was I going to say? I, I don't know. I had some other thoughts about it, but it just, I didn't like the overall cheapness of it. I think if you really can't do it justice, they shouldn't have done it at all. Um, it's just not, it's just not good. It added nothing. Like, can you really watch this trilogy? Uh, we already did it. We went through each movie and we said, I said the first one had a purity about it. The first mm -hmm. one was real trailblazing. The second one, it took all the same notes of the first one, but it went bigger and it added this and did some, you know, big, this one adds nothing. Like, what did this one add? Oh, I did like kind of just it seemed like he kind of had a way he knew he wanted to bookend it and he kind of made the movie around that. And I'll get to that. But like I, I wrote down like there's a, a scene where uh, there's a couple scenes in the movie where he sees victims from his past, like the first uh, two movies. Yeah. So he sees the girl he raped and that hung herself from the first movie. He and that's this, a really cheesy. That's yeah. a really cheesy scene because did you notice like the effect is weird. Yeah, she goes to kiss him. Like, uh, he's not kissing her. He's kissing like a weird digital effect. It's fucking weird. It, it looks like uh, they basically did some effect afterwards so that she's still in black and white since we see her in black and white in the first movie. And like, so she comes to kiss him. And like, if you look on her cheek, like, it looks like the prosthetic has like a little like a piece that's torn and mm -hmm. it's just like dangling there. I, I I don't know if that's what it was it or if it I... looks cringe. Yeah, that whole scene looked cringe. Yeah, because he's kissing her from the side and. Uh, yeah, it looks really odd, and I get it. They, for them to establish these demons again, they had the flashback to the old movies because they got different actors. Obviously, uh, mm -hmm. they had to have these flashbacks to establish who they were. But I, it was kind of off-putting, and I get it. Movies do this all the time. They flashback to previous movies, and it's usually pretty seamless. The only difference is, is that's not usually in movies that are forty years younger. So it was a little mm -hmm. off-putting when they would have this cheesy-looking Goosebumps movie with <laughs> that's just corny looking and they'd flash back to the old black and white movie. And I'd see, cause to me, those two coffin Joe's don't look anything alike, man. He aged like shit. Mm -hmm. He aged like milk. Um, oh yeah. So it's like when they flash back to that, I'm like, Oh, okay. Yeah. That's a better movie. And then it comes back to this. Like, okay, I get it. They had to do it. That's, yeah. that's supposed to be the girl. Great. There's also a, a, like a scene where he sees Laura, the one that uh, was gonna like actually got pregnant, but died. And she's, Laura, holding, like, Laura. she's holding the fetus. And he, uh, like she changes into like, uh, uh, and like a, the the first girl that he let the spiders bite in the first movie, uh -huh. and then the spiders like come out of him. He's freak. Then, uh, he's freaking out. He's like freaking shit. And that's yeah. yeah. He, he starts freaking having a panic attack, and that's when he's like, they color the spiders black and white too. Yeah, weird. I mean, that's weird. Like, are they going meta with that, or like, well, I don't know why? Yeah, uh, yeah, a bit. Yeah, and there was a torture scene that where they drove hooks into a guy's uh, real back. You could tell they just kind of got one of those guys from the circus shide show that does that. Yeah, and then uh, they, but why wouldn't you? You know, whatever. Yeah, and they scalped a, a a woman. That was kind of a cool effect. And then the rat and the snatch. Uh, and then uh, I can talk about the ending of this one. Um. In the final act, the cops show up and break up their torture party. Their little uh, Guantanamo Bay they got. Uh, Joe slips out through the back, which results in s some cat and mouse that uh, leads to an abandoned circus fair ground. And he seems like really excited that like, oh, we're going to be in a circus now. You could tell like he's been listening to ICP records while he's locked up all that time. <laughs> so like we have Coffin Joe all of a sudden uh, knowing how to work all these uh, mechanics inside the little uh, fun house, you know, section <laughs> while the colonel's going through. So he's like, he's using like the weird, uh, clown prop in the fun house to like move around and shit. It's like, how the fuck does he know how to do that? So the Colonel ends up with like the upper hand, but he loses it when he, uh, like Joe, he's haunted by a ghost from his past. It looks like some little kids that maybe like he shot at from like earlier in the movie, like we were mentioning. And, uh, I think it was like the two kids he killed. Yeah. 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 So like he, uh, after that, uh, coffin Joe, he gets the upper hand and uh, he kills him, and uh, on his way out, uh, he encounters the monk. And the monk actually gets the better of him and uh, stabs him through the heart, which is kind of a cool effect. It looks like they just got a real, like, heart from, like, a, a pig or something and just yeah. stabbed into it. And then uh, and then the girl comes back, who he said was just a girl and was too young to have his seed for some reason. Like, he's got fucking standards once again. He didn't fuck the young hot piece. Um, and yeah, then she, so she gets a dead man heart and fucks a dead dick. I don't understand. It's it. a good thing he died with a boner, because, like... <laughs> 
she starts uh mounting him and like yeah it looks like he, he comes back to life at least to impregnate her because uh like he, he starts groping her tits and it's kind of funny because like his long nails make it hard for him to get like a grip on her tits and then like <laughs> yeah, uh, it looks weird it looks weird <laughs> He's like just grazing <laughs> over him. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. And then we get the epilogue, and uh, it's kind of like I thought this was kind of a cool ending. It's him being kind of meta, and like you know, uh, they come uh, visit his tombstone, and we see that like all these women are are pregnant now, and it's kind of hinting that like yeah, now he's like he's gonna die someday, and he's got these movies that people can remember him by, and it's kind of it's kind of a meta cool little ending. I thought it worked. And, like, it seems like maybe that was, like, oh, that would be a cool way to end it. And that's just kind of the idea he had. So, he wrote the movie around that, maybe. Well, I I don't – part of me wants to not be too hard on it because after 40 years, I have to imagine that maybe he was making it for the fans. I don't know how much mm-hmm. he really wanted to wrap it up. Maybe he was just getting, you know, fans for 40 years that really loved the first they movie. Did, yeah, people did refer to it as a trilogy. And he always said, like, it's not. And so, maybe he just, like, oh, I'll give him a third one. Yeah, uh, you know, for 2008, I mean, he was probably doing cons and shit back then. Who knows? Maybe local and people were driving him crazy about it. I, I just, I know if I had a legacy that was 40 plus years old, I would not want to risk shitting on it. <laughs> Unless mm. I had a lot of people that it meant the world to, I guess. Um, yep. I mean, I'd, I'd rather do something different, at least. I wouldn't stop working, but I wouldn't resurrect that. Uh, do you want to like go into like overall scores of the movie? I I'll, I'll tell you, yep, I'll tell yeah. I'll tell you my. So I can see myself flip flopping. Like I said, I like the first two probably equally for different reasons, uh, and I'm gonna give them sixes, mm-hmm. and I like that. You know, I you know because they are really antiquated. So and I'm just coming into them now. Uh, I bet you a million dollars if I saw these in 19 fucking 64, 1967, they'd be higher in sixes. Mm-hmm. guarantee it um yeah like right I, I think that's what i thought when i saw them for the first time but they always just kind of stayed in my mind and i always wanted to watch them again maybe it maybe give you some stuff every time you rewatch them i could see that yeah uh, the, these were kind of like my uh universal horror movies because i didn't watch those as a kid so i remember whenever you, you got me to watch those i was uh, yeah i was kind of like oh okay and uh like like uh, these were kind of like that for me growing up. I think that oh, I, I respect those movies tremendously. I I enjoyed them. I'm glad I watched them. And uh, like I said, I it was it's really cool to watch old movies like that doing pretty impressive stuff for the day. Uh, yeah, and uh, nothing but respect for them. I I enjoyed them. And uh, on a technical level, like I said, I, the fact that 1967, that second movie, I, I'm even asking how they did a doubling effect. Because it looked good, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it's pretty impressive. So I, I, I like them. They, it might go up in time because I, I, you know, have a lot of respect for them. The third one, man. Oh, like I said, I want to be kind of kind to it because I have to believe it wasn't just him wanting to make this movie. <laughs> he probably was doing it as a nice gesture uh, to the fans. But uh, I don't know what's a what's a fair, but what's a score that's not too harsh because i don't want to be too harsh four with the third one i was teetering on four a five or a six yeah not yeah, yeah. oh you're a six? Oh, i was teetering on like i couldn't decide because i was entertained through the movie like uh, as long as i'm entertained and it's you know it's not something that like at some point i was looking at my watch or whatever it was see i was i was having a hard time staying in this one i really was mm-hmm. uh the yeah. uh, and i just watched this one before we started recording you were saying little mm-hmm. plot points about like the circus shit at the end and him. Co- I, I that's that's blotchy to me because I bet you I was looking at my watch or whatever for a couple minute for mm-hmm. a minute there. Yeah, this one was real tough, man. So like I I think I'm being kind to it. I'll give it a four. <laughs> but uh, mm-hmm. that's just because, like I said, I think the respect, the pedigree of where the movie came from. And like I said, I, I think it's ultimately harmless because of probably where it was coming from and him making it. Uh, and, and and at the end of the day, he was ultimately doing the same. Sh- I was watching this movie, this new, this last one, thinking to myself, could this same movie have been made uh, as a follow up in like 1969, and would it have worked? It probably would have. Mm-hmm. Like I could see this exact same story they were doing in black and white in 1969 with the young fucking coffin Joe and all this shit, and it, the same hokiness would have worked back then. I mean, I could see. Yeah, it probably would have fared a little better. I still don't think it would have been. I think after the first two would have been like would have been kicking a dead horse still. I don't think I would have liked it as much, but I just think it's the time and place. 
Mm-hmm. So I'll give it a four. And it would like, like we were talking about before the whole pinhead thing. It was really off putting when they were calling him coffin Joe, <laughs> but yeah, it was kind of like, I don't know. <laughs> but at the same time, I'll, I'll there's lo- even a part, there's even a part uh, where they're showing old footage from the second movie. And, and instead of calling him Z, like they did in the original, they they put Cough and Joe instead in the subtitle. Yeah, I know I noticed that. And uh that that fucked with me a little bit actually. But I was I'll I'll let that pass too, because if this guy has been nefarious and notorious and locked up for forty years by crimes he committed back in the day, he's probably in that world a local boogeyman. Uh I could easily see him kind of getting a name over the years, right? Like the boogeyman or Bloody Mary, right? Mm-hmm. So I'll let it slide. They just decided to be meta with it and call it what the fans called it. But cause, yeah. but at the same time, it would have been weird if they would have gave it their own boogeyman name. Like, what? No, he's Coffin Joe. You don't just all of a sudden call him fucking uh, Tomb Jack. Mm-hmm. You know? what? So what do you do, right? <sighs> Whatever. I, I give the, the first two sevens. Okay. And you give the... And what, what do you... You said you teetered five or six on the third one? Yeah, I couldn't just... Because uh, it was... It, like, it kept me entertained through the movie. But like it was like there were things that were underwhelming about. It. We didn't talk about that weird ass vision he had, where uh, it, it seemed like it was really like Alejandro Jordorowski inspired. Like uh, th- that was like the the scene that like uh, right away you're like, what the fuck? This is like it's very like green screen, and then like this weird uh, nameless old guy with a beard shows him like yeah, <laughs> that's vision fucking of, true. Like, I'm like when yeah. I first saw that, I'm like, is he back in hell? There was a vision of like uh, people being crucified and then like women biting their dicks off. Yeah. I. And then that's whenever uh, he shows them a woman and he says, this is the one. And I was confused. Uh, like it, that happened right after a scene where he was like kind of having sex with another woman. And I was like, okay, did he get her pregnant? But it's a, it's like a, a daughter and he wants to, he wants a son specifically. So I wasn't sure I might've been misinterpreting that. Yeah, I I don't fucking know, man. Um, but yeah, uh, I'm happy I got to watch it. I'm happy I could say I. I did you, have you ever seen any of the other Coffin Joe movies that he just appeared in? Uh. Uh-uh. Yeah, I, there's a couple like uh, I've had on my watch list. Now, if uh, if he if he was appearing as Coffin Joe in that 40 years, like between the sequels. Like, do we get to see the different iterations of him aging? Like, is there like a middle aged Coffin Joe? Is there like a? I think in the seventies he made like kind of a, a metal one, like uh, what, what Wes Craven did with the New Nightmare. Like it was him writing a Coffin Joe movie or something. Interesting. I, I forget exactly what the plot is. Well, let's uh, let's go into comments. Zach uh, was nice enough to compile the comments from the last all the episodes because it's it gets tough to keep track of that shit, especially when we haven't had an episode in a couple of months, but. Let me uh, go ahead and read them. We'll see if I can get these straight. Oh, yeah. There, there's also a cool uh, thing for people. Uh, if you're on YouTube, uh, the uh, oh, man, uh, John Stewart show before he was on like a uh, fucking what's that show called? He had his own show like on something. The Daily Show. Yeah. He, had, he used to just have the John Stewart show and they had uh, Coffin Joe on as a guest. And that was, it was pretty funny. Oh, he really did? Yeah. That was cool. You know, Coffin Joe... You know, I regret not going to that house core horror film fest that first year because Coffin Joe was there. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was in 2000, was that 2014? 2014? Maybe, yeah. uh, and that's when we, Riverman and I talked to Corey, uh, sorry, uh, it's not Corey G, Corey Mitchell. He was the mm-hmm. true crime author and the curator of the festival with Phil Anselmo. So I had, I remember I interviewed Phil Anselmo and talked to him and him and, and Todd and I had a long talk with a uh, Corey Mitchell. He was a fun conversation because we were just like geeking out. And he, I remember, I remember we were having so much fun, just like geeking out talking. Uh, somebody came into his office and told him he had a point. He's like, no, 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 get out, get the fuck out of here. He's like, I'm having fun with this. And we just kept mm-hmm. going talking about music and shit and movies. Um, and he, I remember at the time nails was like, remember N- nails was like the big, like critical darling, right? In the metal world. Like that first oh, nails. Yeah. yeah. Nails that first out. And he was all about nails. He was talking about nails and, uh, that's just what I remember. Anyway, he died the next year, right? Oh, yeah. Man. He had a heart attack in the parking lot after the second one wrapped the second mm-hmm. annual. But anyway, he were, the one of the big concepts that he's bringing in Coffin Joe, like they he they said that was his, they were really proud of that score because they were able to get him out there and he was flying up to Texas and they they gave us passes. Mm-hmm. Like like Corey Mitchell and Phil and Summer, we got passes to go, and it was really cool. And I was looking forward to, and I was really looking forward to going there, man. Actually hanging out with them, and you know, just like on that level, and like ah, oh, because he was a real cool dude. Mm-hmm. And uh, we wanted to go. Riverman and I both wanted to go and get flights or 
you know, or drive, you know, me meet him in Nebraska and we'll go. But uh, yeah, I didn't end up going just because Todd bailed. Go figure. Riverman bailed. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> and he just couldn't justify like the trip. It probably a money thing. But I'm like, we have the passes. We have all this stuff. Like we got VIP. It'd be fun. Like we can because the idea was to go there and just have fun. A and like just interview everybody because we were already in good with the curators. Mm-hmm. And they would just like let us, you know, whatever. And I'm like, this would be so cool. And yeah, I I kind of regret it. I should have said, even without Todd, I should have went. I should have just went myself. Mm-hmm. But uh, it just didn't seem like as fun a time not going with Todd. But I, I should have because I regret it because he died. And obviously, Coffin Joe ended up dying a decade, you know, not a decade later, five, six years later. Um, mm-hmm. But I don't think Coffin Joe did a lot of appearances. That's why I think it was a big deal. You know, mm-hmm. he was he was because he was older. This is like, what, 2014. He died. What, last year? This year? This year. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I regret that. It's one of my regrets. Um, and, and they had a really fucking badass like because uh, it was live music and a film festival and a con at the same time. Right. Mm-hmm. And they had uh, like Guar was playing and they had all these. I don't know. I don't remember. There's a lot of fucking bands playing a lot of heavy bands, too. And I, I just thought it was a fucking waste i was like todd we can go there we can get interviews and footage of all these awesome awesome fucking bands that are gonna be there all these fucking film people that are gonna be there cough and joe i'm sure would have given us an interview mm-hmm. uh, you, you probably would have had a, needed to have a translator though oh you're right translator are you sure you can't speak english at all well, maybe. he had a tra- he might he had a translator on the uh the interview i was talking about with uh John Stewart. Well, well, I tell you what, though, if he was at this convention, he would have had a handler there with him at the, his mm-hmm. booth. So I'm pretty sure maybe I could have gotten her to translate or him. Right. Mm-hmm. I just the the possibilities would have been endless. It would have been really fucking cool. So I regret that deeply. Um, anyway, uh, so let's read some comments. The the first comments I'll read, they come from our uh, commentary for Ken Park. We read these on an episode of the BTM commentary when they came just because they were so funny. Yeah, um, we we can skip those if you don't want to go through them again. Yeah, they're they're really funny. But if you want to see some people get trolled by Zach, go on that one. Uh, the Ken Park commentary is just, or sorry, the episode of Cinema Enema. It's just one of those things, man. Sometimes a movie really hits, and it just becomes one of those movies where a lot of people it it it, it ticks all the right algorithm boxes. <laughs> so. Mm-hmm. It just gets out there. And like that video probably has almost 400,000 hits, right? Because it just keeps circulating the bigger it gets. And then, you know, when you have something like that, you're going to have more people that think they're going to watch the movie. So, you know, you're going to get a lot of people that are angry about that. And they, they post really funny comments. Like somebody today posted a trash can emoji. Like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Should we start like, instead of just putting cinema in a put cinema in a podcast, maybe then they'll like, they do it for the commentaries too. It doesn't matter. It doesn't yeah. matter what we do. They're always going to do it because people see picture. They click good, you know, mm. and sometimes it could be like Linda Hamilton with Dave Mustaine's fucking face. And it doesn't matter. <laughs> like they, they're still not going to fuck. They're still, <laughs> they're still not going to get it. I mean, I don't know what to say. The thing is, is we don't want to cripple our content. So we don't want to make them happy and destroy ourselves in the algorithm. We don't, I think to make them happy, if we're going to have a cinema enema about Ken Park, it would be to call it cinema enema number whatever, and then just have a picture of our face on it. Okay, let's Mm -hmm. not tell anybody what we're talking about. I can't help Mm -hmm. it. People can't read. I mean, the thing is, is when you're on YouTube and you're online or you're looking up Google and you're doing a search, people are click happy. You click first, then you think, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But at the end of the day, and that's what people do on YouTube. And at the end of the day, um, and I also, I think what the culprit is, too, is like it depends on where people are consuming YouTube. If they're consuming it on their mobile, you know, titles and shit get cut off when you're looking at thumbnails. So you're just seeing pictures yeah. a lot of times. So whatever. But that's not Zach and my problem. <laughs> we can't help that. Uh, and the thing is, is I'm, I'm guilty of it, too. I've been click happy. I'm like, oh, that's not what I thought it was. I don't fucking blow up their comments like you fucking <laughs> idiots. Like, I mean, like, what did I? I didn't. I, I, what did I lose? Like, oops. It's, just, just, it's Yeah, it's your fault. And then plus you came here hoping to see a movie like you should have known you weren't going to. <laughs> and and it doesn't matter. I fucking I click on shit all the time. And I'm like, oh, OK, it's not quite what I thought it was. And I move on. <laughs> I don't I don't make a fucking yeah. thing of it. So uh, you know what's funny is sometimes they even have those clickbait ones where it's like, here's the full movie. You click on it. It's just a, like a, a, a loop. single yeah, and it just tells you go to this website to see the movie, and it's like that, I don't even even then I don't go fuck you in the comments. Yeah, yeah, because I'm still kind of expecting it. But uh, yeah. But yeah, but even then, like that, those people I can at least understand a smidgen of your anger. But uh, 
with that said, there's plenty of people that love it. So it's just whatever. It's just, uh, it's like anything, man. You could be the biggest fucking celebrity movie star, fucking pop star in the world. The bigger you are, the more lovers and supporters you have, the more people you're going to have that hate you. It's just the fucking natural way of it is. But, uh, I, I, but I still like the, you got more dislike. You make good. You make read good. I still, (laughs) I get a trip out of it. Uh, I don't give a fuck. But anyway, oh, and by the way, at the end of the day, uh, for anybody, nobody that leaves those has left those comments is going to be listening to this episode because they're just fly buyers. Mm-hmm. They're not our like dedicated listener base. So basically, I can't really give a message to them because you're not them. But what I would say is, I mean, Zach and I are the ones that are laughing. We don't give a shit, man. Like, even if you give us a thumbs down because, you know, you thought you were watching the movie. uh it still helps us in the algorithms because it's still interaction with our video. And that's why a video like that is still going to get more traction, right? I mean, it might be getting down votes because more people are getting fooled or whatever, but it still puts our channel on the map and it, it, you know, more of our videos are going to show up. So we're going to mm-hmm. hopefully get more people that like it. I mean, like I said, it doesn't really bad news is still good news, right? Bad press is still press. It's one of those things, but mm-hmm. whatever. Fuck them. I mean, I, I don't know. I wish these people would actually fucking and what's that one one guy said, I'm sure glad well no one guy actually wanted to listen to it. He just hated our fucking commentary. Mm-hmm. Uh he was just basically saying, Man, I'm sure glad you guys put timestamps on here because you know, you guys basically he accused us of not like uh, actually giving a good cri- our critique of the movie didn't match what he his critique. Wasn't good enough. Yeah. yeah. I don't give a fuck, man. It's totally fine. Like, I'm going to read that. I don't get, we've been talking about it so long. I'm going to actually read this guy. Cause he, I, but, I was actually just thinking about putting our original, like whenever we read it for the first time at the end of this so that they could just hear it. No, I'll Did just, you? no, I'll, I'll just go over. I'll just do really quick. He All just, right. but the, uh, the reason why I don't mind this guy is because a guy like this, he's actually giving us criticism. This I don't mind. I, I trolled him anyway. Yeah, but it's, I trolled him anyway. I'm glad you included timestamps because I skipped all the way ahead of the video for the film discussion, and I couldn't have been more disappointed. You could have read about the history of the film, have been more informed of its actors and director, or have had a legitimate intellectual discussion about the nature of the content itself. Instead, you watched a controversial film and focused on how sick and twisted it was, or how great a female character's tits are. Way to go. People like you are the reason this film will probably never get a legitimate release. <laughs> And then, doesn't mean anything people like us the people that want to watch the movie are the reason no one will put it out that doesn't make sense i don't remember what oh you you gave a big long fucking tro- go, just go on the video and look at zach's big ass troll response and this guy makes the ultimate mistake i'm not going to reread it but he makes the ultimate mistake of whenever zach yeah, yeah of responding because most people that don't do that they get shut down by zach and they just they take their lumps and they leave he responded and then <laughs> it just feeds the troll more so uh because, like I said, read it, it, it. That critique is so fucking. St- I respect it, but we did talk about the movie. We did talk about the subtext. We did talk about the. We had an intellectual, deep conversation about the director and and how fucking weird he is. I mean, like, how much are we supposed to break open? A, 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 I don't know. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But I appreciate comments like that. As long as you're giving something critical. I mean, I don't troll. That's Zach's thing. But. Don't be afraid. Comment. It's it's totally fine. Just uh, Zach doesn't bite. All right. On one of our older episodes from two months ago, uh, Will and Matt's excellent podcast comment regarding the whole should movies be remade discussion. I think the only way a remake can work is if you can bring something new to the table, but keep the general premise. Look at The Fly and The Thing. Both are remakes of films from the 50s, but both retain the same concept, but explore something new. The problem is a lot of remakes are content with telling the same tale and not doing anything different. Plus, when a movie is so timeless and perfect, it still holds up years after it's made. There shouldn't be a reason for a remake of said film to exist, but that won't stop studios from trying to capitalize off of the love of some films have. Long story Mm. short, don't remake Back to the Future. Sorry, Mac, he says. Don't remake Ghostbusters. Whoops, too late, he says. Just avoid remaking something unless you're willing to take risks and do something new. Yeah, because that stuns. We were having a conversation because Mac... uh, Mac was sending messages about he was sending some fucking like we got this cover dot com links or whatever about <laughs> back to the future like oh back to the future like you know talks of like fucking Robert Downey Jr. playing Doc and and Tom Holland playing you know what's funny too is if that never happens but then like well, someday they do like make a back to the future remake and they cast completely different people in it he'll be like see I was right yeah <laughs> 
and, and that, that whole thing started with like, I just think there's some movies you can't touch. Like whether or not I, I think E.T. is overrated, like I was saying, you can't remake E.T. Yeah. It's it's just exactly. it, he's literally the poster boy of Amblin Entertainment. Like, yeah, right. You know, it's like you can't just change a uh, mascot and icon. You can't remake Forrest Gump. You can't remake mm-hmm. fucking Jaws. You can't remake. Did you know that they were planning on making a Forrest Gump part two? Oh. And it was going to be like uh, like he's showing up and like thing, bad things are happening. Like basically it's the same plot. Like he's showing up. He's meeting all these people, and then it turns out he's responsible for like bad things happening after they left, or something like that. That is the worst idea I've ever heard in my life. Yeah, they ended up not doing it because nine eleven happened. That's a and terrible like, idea. Yeah, they were like after nine eleven happened, they they kind of recouped later on. They were like, "Is this a story worth telling?" No, and then they just dropped it. <laughs> yeah, that's a terrible idea. On the Poughkeepsie tapes that was featuring Riverman, by the way, Mendoza, Adrian Mendoza, the Omega himself says, "Aaron, if you don't know what movie to watch, check out God's Own Country. It's streaming on Netflix. It's a beautiful film about two men falling in love. It's basically Brokeback Mountain set in Northern England. Are you positive we haven't read this? Dog." We might have, actually. <laughs> well, he gets to hear it again if we did. I, I can't keep track, man. He says, I need to get back to watching Curb Your Enthusiasm. I love hearing Zach urinate in the background. Buck Angel was a guest in the Howard Stern show and rode the Sibian. Buck left an odor in the studio after she climaxed. Aaron, I agree with your review of It Chapter 2. Great episode, guys. I love Riverman and have listened to these uh, and enjoyed listening to him on this show uh, over the last two weeks. Yeah, I have a feeling maybe I'm getting deja vu because this is three months ago. I think we would have read these in the last episode, unless I, I forgot. I think we might not have read it on the cinema, and well, that might be. I might have forgot because that might have happened. Um, uh, Poughkeepsie tapes as well. Feline Fatale, uh, they say. Uh, she says, I enjoyed It Chapter 2 until I reread the book after many years. And these movies pale in comparison to the source material. Uh, I agree. I, it Chapter 2 is not uh, very good. Uh, let's see here. The Abyss commentary, the, uh, sorry, not commentary, Cinema Enema. This was the last one we did. This was my pick. Mendoza says, I watched this film when it came out and I loved it. I still love the film. I watched The Abyss, the theatrical cut last year, and it still holds up. I don't know if I need to see the director's cut. It's a quiet blockbuster, if that makes sense, he says. It's not a bombastic popcorn film uh, like his previous films. Michael Bean plays a creepy antagonist. I need to watch Prisoners and the Deuce. I watched Brain Damage a couple of weeks ago, and I absolutely loved the film. I knew nothing about it. Joe Bob presented the film, and I'm glad he did. There is no need for a Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead remake. Oh, yeah. I agree with everything you said here. Brain damage is awesome. Uh, I don't think Don't Tell Mom needs a fucking remake. Uh, Yeah, you should watch The Deuce. You should watch Prisoners. That's an awesome movie. I really liked it. And uh, I don't know. You might, if you like the Abyss theatrical cut, I think you might get something out of the, because the director's cut is supposed to add, because everybody's problem with the Abyss and the reason why it's kind of, you know, it's still a good movie, but it's like the lesser. It's, it's, it's standing next to Giants. That's the only problem, right? It's standing yeah. next to T- T1, Terminator 2, you know, and these fucking movies. But everybody's problem with it is saying, and even Michael Bean said this. I read an interview with Michael Bean recently where he was saying, like, that's the only blip in James Cameron's career. And it's just it's just because of the ending. The end, He didn't stick the ending. And uh, I hear that the director's cut makes that better yeah apparently they cut out like some subtext that would have made the ending like more satisfying or something and and we went over it on the cinema anima and it is way better it just it fits so much better so i i think you should watch it if you enjoy the movie maybe next time if you want to watch it anyway just go for that version but it's kind of a long watch so it's it's on you uh blocko 69 on the abyss he says apparently ed harris almost drowned on the set of the abyss just like his character in the movie the abyss yeah, I remember hearing that. Yeah, and apparently, uh, people were like uh, shitting. Uh, I forget which director it was, and uh, uh, so they were like, "Oh, this guy did this," and then like they contrasted that with James Cameron and said, "Oh, he's never done anything like that." And then there were people in the comments like, "Actually, uh, fucking Ed Harris did almost drown on the set of The Abyss, and he did keep the camera rolling while it was happening." <laughs> <laughs> what a fucking they all scumbag! Have this shitty thing. <laughs> <laughs> So, in all fairness, so he could have been like. So you got. I thought you were acting, dude. So you got. Uh, you got Landis. You got fucking Tarantino have been accused of that, and you got Cameron. Yeah, you probably. Th- I think all directors are going to be to a degree. Was the camera rolling? Mm-hmm. Even if even if you're that guy who does stop and get him help after he gets wheeled off and the gurney, you're probably asking somebody in quiet. Was the camera running? Did you get it? Mm-hmm. Um, all right. The Abyss as well. Oliver Klozoff says, it's a shame that a classic like Dawn of the Dead is so hard to find. I can't find it on any streaming sites and I refuse to pay $90 for a Blu-ray. 
I got a copy of that Blu-ray, man. I'll sell it to you for 85. If you don't want to pay 90 for it, <laughs> I got a copy. The one I gave him. No, that's a DVD. Oh, okay. I have the Blu-ray. Uh, yeah. Uh, no. The Dawn of the Dead? Yeah. Oh, I didn't even know that. Yeah, I have I have the Day of the Dead and the Dawn of the Blu-rays that are like, you know, out of print now. And he's right. They go for a lot of money. Um, but yeah, I bought them for a longest time. Like back when I bought them, you could buy them at Target for like 10 bucks, you know. Mm-hmm. But now they're out of print. But I, I, I wouldn't sell it. I'm just kidding. I love it. All right, guys. So thank you so much for uh, joining us on this episode of Cinema Anima. Now, next time, it's my choice kind of continuing the trend of exploring new ways to uh, hold down topics for the show. Uh, my idea is I want to finally do the discussion, the roundtable talk about Hellraiser 1 versus 2, right? Because uh, oh, I've yes. mentioned it before. If you guys are first timers on here. I think uh, Hellraiser 2 is quite the polarizing sequel. Some people love it. Some people don't. I'm on the fence of people that don't. I'm not a defender of it. I think it uh, tarnishes the original, but uh, it's an interesting talking piece. And my idea was to, they both agreed to be on the show. So hopefully we can, we can get that scheduled. Uh, But goat, I want goat on the show and I want Josh James on the show. Right. And uh, I think, and they've never been on, on a show before together. So that'll be a new dynamic, a new Mark lineup, right? Cause we've never had that, mm-hmm. that combination. And uh, I think they would make good commentators together. So hopefully that'll be a really cool chat. I know down the line, uh, Zach will pick something else after that, but down the line, I would like to use this show as a vehicle to do more talks like that. I would like to have the uh, alien three chat, like all the different versions mm-hmm. on that show. That's perfect. Cause God willing, I am never going to do another commentary for it again. Because we did the Alien 3 commentaries fucking a couple years ago, and they, they about damn near killed us. Mm-hmm. But uh, to be able to talk about them and all the different versions, the producer cut, the theatric cut, and all this bullshit would be great, and all the drama behind the scenes. So, uh, but yeah, next time it'll be the Hellraiser 1 versus Hellraiser 2 and an in-depth discussion on that. And those are, you know, the original Hellraiser is a, a film I'm pretty passionate about and I know a lot about. And I know a lot about the second one, too which adds to my disdain for it. So it'll be awesome. But other than that, guys, let us know what you want to hear. Uh, if you guys are listening to this right now, just know that um, you got it right now for free, but you could have had it a few days earlier if you're on our Patreon. Uh, if you guys want to look below, all the links, you know, we're everywhere, YouTube, uh, wherever. If you want to support us, we have a Patreon out there, and we're always looking for feedback on things that we can add to it to, to create more of a value for you guys. Uh, but ultimately, Zach and I want to create more content. And, uh, you know, we're kind of at a point where I don't really think we can do. We, we're always consistent, but we'd like to be able to do even more. So any, uh, you know, support on your guys's end will just assure that we can get you guys exclusive episodes, uh, even new fucking free episodes. Uh, we're trying to just kind of figure that out. But uh, it all goes a long way. If you guys want to support another way, we have a Teespring as well. And uh, we have designs for Cinema Enema, the BTM podcast, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Check that out. Mac and Zach Save the World stuff on there. Uh, and, and hopefully, Zach, uh, I've twisted his arm and there's going to be a new Cinema Enema design for this episode, a Coffin Joe themed one. I think it'd be fucking mm-hmm. rad. But uh, check out the link to see if it's there. Uh, but those are great because T- uh, Teespring always kicks us back a nice chunk of everything we sell there. So that would be awesome. And uh, by all means, if you guys uh, buy anything, I can't say I can't see who buys stuff. We just see that people buy stuff and it's awesome. So uh, if you guys want to tag us on Instagram, man, we'll give you fucking props and we'll give you shout outs on the show and, and the whole thing. And, um, you know, I know I know a couple of you guys have done that. So that's awesome. Uh, other than that, same old st- uh, stuff, man. Uh, like us on Facebook, like the video. I hear if you like a video in the first fucking couple of hours it comes out, uh, it really helps in the algorithm push. So if you see it pop up in your feed, give us a like. Uh, make sure you guys subscribe to the channel if you're new here. Share us with people you think might dig the show as well. And uh, if you guys aren't already on podcast uh, services, uh, you can follow our free feeds on on. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher. Um, I prefer the podcast channels. That's my thing. I don't really listen to us on YouTube. I mean, we're a podcast. It makes sense. But uh, some of you guys like YouTube. But even if you guys are YouTube diehards, if you wanted to support us just by going over to those podcast services and leaving us a review, that is fucking gold to us. Um, And that's just going to help us climb up the charts and the algorithms over there. And so we can at least get exposure to people that are like-minded and we can grow the Revival family. But that's all we got for now, man. Zach, you got any last words? 
Be excellent to each other. And party on, dudes. Bye-bye, puppets. back. I'm here with my good friend and new boss, Coffin Joe. And uh, Coffin Joe's films, they're available on uh, Something Weird Video, am I right? Yeah. And uh, you'll also be at the Chiller Convention in uh, Meadowlands Hilton, New Jersey. Meadowlands Hilton, New Jersey. This weekend, yeah. All right, Coffin Joe, everybody. Right. I want to thank, all right, settle down. I want to thank tonight's guests, especially Bob Bunny and Pat Kelly. Congratulations to the Yankees. Uh, Arrested Development are going to play us out. I'm going to see you tomorrow. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Bye.